Good morning. Welcome into Herd at Sports Radio AM 590 ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri Cities. I'm Ravi Lula here on the Pillar Exterior Stage. DB will be joining me in just a little bit when he gets done with practice over there at Westside. Until then, it's just Shane to keep me company this morning. What's up, Shane? Uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> how, how are you this morning? Shane? Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm okay. You're doing all right. You're doing okay. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> That's always good to hear. We uh, we love to hear it. Got a good show coming up for you this morning. Um, as always, we've got our Thursday regulars in Brian Edwards, uh, our Vegas insider, coming up at eight forty-five. Of course, we'll talk to our dear friend Michael Brunts at nine. But before we get to any of that, we're gonna talk to Tom Deanhart to uh, continue in our preview of Nebraska's opponents. Tom, of course, with blackandgold.com covering Purdue. So we will talk to Tom at 745 uh, to continue our, our discussion of the, of the Nebraska football schedule winding down to UTEP during game week, which is, just a couple weeks away. 13, nope, not 13. I can't do math. 16, 16 days, Shane. We're almost to the two-week mark. Come on, math. We might be able to make it. We might be able to make this after all. We. Uh, it's going to come up pretty quickly. It is, especially after. Sometimes not quick enough. I know I know. there's a lot of people out there counting the days down, and they want it to get here, but it'll be here quick enough we're we're itching we're itching to get to college football i can't wait it'll it'll seem faster after next week when we get week zero games i know nebraska's not playing yet but we'll get real college football a week from saturday so that'll be exciting um and then i think i think we'll we'll be in the home stretch from there and i'll i'll be pretty excited excited about it um so we've got lots to cover between now and then uh, one thing that I did want to touch on, you know, we uh, we we talked yesterday about J.J. McCarthy and his injury uh, came out after his meniscus surgery that he'll be missing the entire season, um, which, to be fair, wasn't the plan. We talked a lot about yesterday about kind of people's processing of information and how, you know, we tend to forget that less than a week ago nobody would have been that worried about jj mccarthy missing a few weeks i think missing the whole season is different um in terms of of what their actual plan was i don't know that it'll be too different in terms of the actual results i think sam darnold was going to start the season as the starter anyway uh at least in their original plan and now obviously he'll that'll be his job throughout the year but um that wasn't maybe the worst news from from Minnesota yesterday as Jordan Addison got carted off the field during practice as well. So not a great stretch here uh, for Vikings fans. Luckily, we're not taking talking to Schaefe or uh, BC today from Husker 24 seven. We'll we'll talk to our our resident Broncos fan, Michael Brunts, but a tough day to be a tough day to be a Minnesota Vikings fan on that front for sure. Um, but I do think the Jordan Addison news probably is of greater actual impact than the J.J. McCarthy news. Uh, another thing that we were talking a lot about yesterday was kind of this uh, along the like, it's where we got started in the conversation about processing information and, and needing to do a little bit better. Uh, it was with the left tackle spot at, at Nebraska with Teddy Prohaska going down. and. Uh, our good friend Jacob Padilla of of Herd at Sports, uh, he'll often text DB and me and and kind of go through some of the points he's got either thoughts about or or disagrees with. Usually disagreeing with me if I'm being honest, but that's okay. We're still friends. Um, about some of the things that have gone on in the show that day, and he he asked I think a a fair question and a question that probably a lot of people at least thought. And there were some there were some other points in here, but I think the main one that we didn't necessarily address yesterday was, is this just an offensive line that was actually good or just cleared a 
relatively low bar from the previous seasons. And I think it's something that a lot of, I think it's something that a lot of, a lot of different Husker fans have thought over the course of the last year or so with the optimism around the offensive line, having kind of ratcheted up a little bit. And I, I, I get it. I do, but I, I get a little bit, I get a little bit frustrated because, you know, and and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I am some expert on offensive line play. Like that's not who I am. That's not what I do. Um, But what I, what I do believe is what I see with my eyes, right? I'm not going to be able to break down technique for you or anything like that, but I, I do think that, you know, when my eyes tell me something's good or bad, I, I can trust them. And last year, my eyes told me the offensive line play was was pretty good and legitimately pretty good, not just clearing a low bar. And if you're, you know, looking for stats or anything to back that up, you know, Nebraska was, I'm, I'm going to go with rushing offense. Nebraska had four and a half yards per carry. That's a number that I think just about everybody would take. They rushed for just under 180 yards per game. And I think that's a number that maybe we'd like to see a little bit higher, but I think most people would take. Now, their rushing touchdowns, DB's talked about this a lot, is not a good number. It's only 16. That number probably needs to be doubled uh, for the amount of rushing that they did last year. But this team was legitimately good at running the football and they were legitimately good at running the football despite a couple obstacles in their way. First and foremost, they didn't really have a passing game to keep the defensive on defenses honest whatsoever. So you're dealing with stack boxes constantly. We've heard about it all off season, you know, where they've had, seven, eight, sometimes nine men in the box last year against their run. And that, yeah, it's pretty hard to get anything done that way. They still average four and a half yards a carry and almost 180 yards per game rushing, despite the fact that there was no passing game to speak of to keep them honest. Now, part of that was quarterback play. Part of that was a rash of injuries at wide receiver. But there was another place there was a rash of injuries and that's in the running back room as well, where you lost two of your top three backs. And so I look at it and I go, okay, they were up against it in terms of not having a balanced enough offense to be able to uh, keep a defense honest. They were up against it in the fact that they lost two of their top three backs. And to be fair, and I've been very consistent about this, two of their top three backs that I don't think were special anyway, they're fine. Again, not disparaging them there. It's a fine backfield. That's about it in my mind. So you don't have special running backs. And I don't think anyone thinks they were special last year. Even if you think they can be good this year, nobody thought they were special last year. So you have a fine group of running backs, but not special. You have no passing game to keep the defense honest. What I'm left to believe then is that the offensive line is doing a lot of work in terms of establishing that running game. That's what I'm left to believe based on what my eyes tell me, what the numbers tell me, and the the facts of the situation. So that's one of the reasons that I think that the offensive line was legitimately good. Now, you can make better arguments, I would say, against the pass protection, and that's fair. I would also point out that it's, really challenging to be good in pass protection when you don't really have an idea when or if your quarterback's going to get the ball out. You don't really have an idea if your quarterbacks are going to actually be passing or going to be running and not in like an RPO design run situation, but in the fact that a lot of times they ended up just having to take off. And I don't know if that's because guys couldn't get open because there were injuries in the wide receiver room. If the, if the quarterbacks couldn't read the field as well as they needed to, if they just weren't willing to pull the trigger on throws when they needed to. But DB quoted a stat the other day that Nebraska was actually very good 
in the amount of time quarterbacks had to throw the ball before pressure got to them. And between those two things, you got pass protection, allowing the quarterback time to have uh, have time to throw the ball. You've got the rushing offense, which was good despite all the factors that I listed out. And I'm left to believe that the offensive line was legitimately good, not just clearing an incredibly low bar. I get the question, though. I get the question of like, okay, is it just the fact that it was so bad prior to last year that you raised the floor to average and all of a sudden they look incredible? I get the question. I just don't think it's accurate. Because it's the same question we're going to find ourselves asking, I think, this year at a certain point about the quarterback play. You asked me the same question last year. I ask the same question every year about quarterbacks. I just want them to be average. But that's average this year in the quarterback room is going to look better than average because of the bar we're looking at from last year. And maybe Dylan Rayola is good off the bat, and it's there's no question about whether he's good or average or whatever. But there's a decent chance as a true freshman, there'll be times where he's average and it looks really good because of what we're used to seeing from last year. That's okay. The offensive line can't just be average. That's I'm, I'm putting that out there. The offensive line can't just be average if this team is going to be good. The quarterback kind of can be. And so that's somewhere where I think we actually might be able to get fooled a little bit where, you know, if Nebraska can consistently complete pass, I mean, just consistently complete passes. I mean, that can be the end of the sentence there. But if they can consistently complete passes on like third and six or in these high leverage situations that they weren't able to play catch with last year, then I don't think that's a terribly high bar, but it's going to seem it's it's going to seem like a a huge accomplishment at Nebraska coming off of last year. So I, I get the question and I do think it applies sometimes in other places. I could make the same argument with the wide receiver rooms this year or with the wide receiver room this year. You've got, if, if it stays relatively healthy, you've got a lot of options over there. You've got, I think, more dynamic options in that room than you did last year. But they could still end up being just about average compared to their talent. They don't really have to outperform their talent. And I think we're going to end up believing that they had a really good year uh, in the wide receiver room because of what we came off of last year. And the fact that Nebraska was running out of wide receivers last year, just having a healthy room is going to feel like a huge improvement. So the question makes sense, especially when you've been to the places Nebraska has been over the last handful of years, especially. You know, we can go all the way back to 2016 with lack of bowl games and whatever, but there's been more recent years where it's the product hasn't even looked up to a, a certain standard that that we can tend to live with. Like it's gotten pretty bad at certain points. But I don't think that's I don't think we're viewing the off. I'm not at least I don't think viewing the offensive line through a lens of just the poo poo platter that we received in previous years. I, I think it was actually good. Now, how good can they get? That's a different question. I, I don't I don't know. But I know they're the most experienced group in the Big Ten this year. And that was with Turner Corcoran, not with Teddy Prohaska at left tackle. And so I think that matters. You know, there's a, a couple guys in Ben Scott and Bryce Benhart that had draftable NFL grades. To me, that matters. I know not everybody loves the PFF grades, but Ben Scott and Bryce Benhart both graded out well last year in their PFF grades, top 10, 20 in the country in their position. So, these are guys that are legitimately good. Matt Rule tells us they would have had draft grades. PFF tells me that they graded out well. Um, I, the stats, te the team stats tell me that they were both good in run blocking and pass protection. Now, the passes didn't result in positivity because the passing game was bad. But all those things let me know, like, this is a good group. And Nebraska probably does need them to stay, take a step forward this year. But that doesn't change the fact that you can have expectations 
for this group and not feel weird about it. And part of the reason I believe this is we've got more we've got more history than not with this specific group and this specific O-line coach that things will get better, not worse. And that was kind of my larger point yesterday when I was going through the list of guys that fit sort of prototypical tackle size, which if you're curious, if it's, you know, if you don't want to use DB standard, all the guys that grade out the highest in PFF are right in that six foot five to six foot seven mount about 90% of them are between six, five and six, seven and between 300 and 320 pounds. So the, the, the sizes we used yesterday were about right, I think, but you have way more evidence that this thing is going to look better year over year with uh, coach Rayola specifically with Donnie, than you are that it's going to regress we've seen year over year the product get better. We've also seen year over year the depth get better from his last year with Frost and Mickey Joseph and Mark Whipple to his first year last year with, uh, with Matt Rule to this year. That's what I'm excited about. There is, I mean, my point, you know, I'm, my point of listing all those guys off yesterday wasn't to say, oh, look at all these guys. They're, they're all good. I don't know. I have no idea which one of them which one of them are good and which one aren't. But my point is you've got options that at least fit the mold and what we've seen from this coaching staff and from Donnie Rayola is if you've got options that fit the mold, they will find the way to make those good football players. That's kind of the entire history of Matt Rule's coaching career. And it's what we've seen already in a short amount of time here at Nebraska. And there were no options that we felt good about last year when Nebraska did lose at times. There was a, I think it was only two games, but there were two games last year where Nebraska was missing, missing three offensive linemen. And there were multiple games where they were missing two. And we didn't feel good about even the starting options last year. So my point is not that, you know, Tyler Knack or Grant Seagram or, or you know, I, I think I mentioned Brock Knutson or Gunnar Gatula are all awesome players. My point is with the track record we've seen of development of guys that we didn't think were ever going to be any good, especially older guys that we didn't think were going to be any good, that... Donnie Rayola has beat those expectations. We have more history to believe he's going to beat our expectations of players than that those players are going to regress to whatever we think they are or worse. He keeps you on your toes. And so my point is simply you should trust that track record. You should trust the track record of, you know, even last year when we're looking at it, we're like, okay, what do we know about Henry Litovsky? And what do we know about, you know, what do we know about, uh, you know, these freshmen that are coming in? Are we going to be able to play any of the freshmen at, at online early in the season? I mean, we have we've barely even talked about Grant Bricks, who was a really good recruit, came down to Nebraska and Oklahoma. That's a guy that a lot of people in the country wanted. And I don't think Nebraska should even have to think about playing him this year. Last year, we were begging or, or, or desperate to see if any of the three offensive linemen from Nebraska, Mason Goldman moved over to defense, but at the time, the three offensive linemen from Nebraska could even, could maybe play as true freshmen. You know, you learn how to play football by playing football. And it was a much more dire situation, we thought, depth-wise last year. And... It ended up working out not only fine, but well. It worked out well with guys we didn't think were good in the first place. So I guess maybe I'm just saying that they deserve a little bit more benefit of the doubt. And I really don't think I can overstate, because it seems like we keep forgetting, Turner Corcoran was working with the ones at the start of fall camp. At least at the open practice, 
and I don't think that was an it didn't sound like it was an uh, a one off. Turner Corcoran was working ahead of Teddy Prohaska. That that needs to be remembered here because you still theoretically have your starting offensive line intact. And if that goes the way you want it to, you don't necessarily have to even rotate rotate in a ton of depth unless you want to. It's not like Nebraska runs this super high tempo Oregon style offense where guys are getting winded and you got to get them in and out and kind of run hockey line changes in there. That's not what Nebraska does. Their starting left tackle, their entire starting offensive line from the start of fall camp is still intact. Does it still is it still terrible that the injury to Teddy Prohaska? Absolutely. Would he maybe have taken over at some point in the season as a starter? Maybe. I don't know. What I do know is, as far as we can tell, Nebraska has not lost anything from that starting offensive line group yet. And I think that matters to remember. Just one of those things, a little bump in the road, you know? I also think it matters to remember that by the midpoint of the season, we may have a better idea about some of the guys that I named off yesterday because they may have gotten in some rotation. We're like, oh, that guy's actually pretty good. Remember remember the deal with Justin Evans last year before he had, ended up having to become a starter due to injury? We would see him in in rotations and be like, oh, that guy's pretty good. Oh, we kind of like that guy. He's got a little nastiness to him. That's the same type of thing we could see this year with guys that are in the same spot Justin Evans was last year. Redshirt freshman, guys coming off of you know these body transformations like Gunnar Gatula. That's what's on the table for this year. And the track record would say we have a better chance of that happening than we do the opposite, at least with Donnie Rayola. Appreciate, as always, our guy Jacob chiming in on uh, the topics of the show. Always brings up good points. We disagree a lot, but I still love him. Uh, coming up next, we will get to more Herd Ass Sports Radio here, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, along with Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. Welcome back to Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. I'm Ravi Lula. DB will be joining me in just a few minutes uh, when he wraps up practice at Westside. We are live at Herd Out Sports Bar and Grill. I think we, uh, we've got some, some comments in on the, on the uh, YouTube page. Uh, Tyler says, I think it's Corcoran's year to step up and prove he's the right choice to start. I think it will be okay. You can't discount his experience up to this point. Um, yeah, I do think the experience matters. I don't think it's something he's going to get, uh, credit for because we don't love what that experience looked like. And I, I think that's something that you do have to consider. You know, we talk, I usually talk about it with quarterbacks, but you, if know, you don't love it, leave it. You know, sometimes we get a little too focused on the fact like, oh, they've got a returning starter at quarterback or whatever. And, you know, the returning starter is not always good. Um, So that's not always a positive. But I I do think on the offensive line, Corcoran's uh, starting experience does matter. I think the fact that he's been with Coach Rayola for multiple years matters. I think that the fact that he's been with some of these guys uh, previously and, and been on, on lines with some of these guys previously matters. I also think that he needs to be better than he was previously. That's fair. Um, I think that's a, a totally fair point uh, to be made. I, I also think he will be better. You know, I, I keep bringing up Bryce Benhart, but this is a dude no one wanted to see last year. No one. We were desperate to find someone other than Bryce Benhart other than Bryce Benhart to play right tackle. We were desperate. Anyone. Anyone other than Bryce Benhart. Fast forward a year, and we are, we were so grateful that he decided to forego the NFL draft and a professional, his professional football prospects to return for another year at Nebraska. Now, I know he like transformed his body and he was doing a bunch of other things, and that's fine. He also was being coached by Donovan Rayola for an extra year and being coached in a system that made sense for what Rayola's scheme was on the offensive line. There's no reason that can't be the case with Turner Corcoran. Turner Corcoran 
and Bryce Benhart were very similar level of recruits. They have very, I think, similar level of talent based on their physical abilities. And I think that's something that that matters in this situation. Again, he needs to be better than he has been at this point. He's put uh, he's put some bad tape out. I get it. I I think there's a I think there's a place for him to be the one that takes the big step up this year. Now, obviously, you hope a bunch of, a bunch of guys do, right? You hope you know Ben Scott takes another leap. You hope Justin Evans takes a leap as a young guy. Um, you hope Mike Mazuka takes a leap as a transfer. Uh, you know, there's there's a bunch of guys you hope get better, but Corcoran's the one you look at and you go, okay, that guy has to get better, and that's fine. I I agree. He needs to be better than he was. I that's also, fine. I also think he. I also think he not only will be, but has gotten better than he was. Otherwise, I don't know why he would have been working with the ones over Teddy Prohaska. I'm under the assumption he's already made those improvements. That's why he was working with the ones. Maybe that's too much of an assumption to make. Maybe Teddy was, you know, just having a rough start to camp or whatever before the injury. I don't know. But I only know that Turner was working with the ones and there had to be a reason for that. It can either be he was playing well or Teddy wasn't. You know, that's a to me a 50%. It's a coin flip that Turner Corcoran's already made the improvements we're talking about him having needed to make in order for this thing to work on the offensive line. That's, I think that's reasonable. And I think that's a reasonable ask for, for Nebraska to make on an offensive line that, again, has shown under Rayola. Now it's a short track record i get that but as shown in their track record with rayola that they're going to they're going to improve and maybe not just corcoran maybe some of those younger guys as well i I would assume some of those younger guys as well uh wanted to get back to you know i talked about quarterbacks there for just a second i did want to get back to the quarterbacks in the big 10 because you know as i'm i'm kind of going through the the Big Ten schedule. I'm going through kind of starting to mentally prepare myself for who I think is going to be good, who I think might have some regression. And so I start thinking about who their quarterbacks are, right? I start thinking about who they've got lining up under center. I start thinking about what that might look like, how they fit systems, things like that. You know, Michigan's a really good example. I have no idea what to expect from Alex Orgy. That's going to be a very different and we're assuming it's Alex Orgy, but that's going to be a very different version of Michigan than we saw last year. Maybe it reverts more to kind of the type of offense we saw with Cade McNamara when he was at Michigan. Maybe it reverts more to the type of offense we saw when Sharon Moore was acting as head coach uh, a couple games in the season. I think Penn State was a game where they kind of just ground that thing out. Maybe that's what it looks like with Alex Orgy, and maybe he's a good fit for that. What I do know is it's going to look a lot different. So when I look at Michigan and I look at all the, not only the change at head coach, but the change at quarterback and philosophically what that could mean, you're going from a guy that apparently was the savior in Minnesota after one preseason game to a guy that we don't even for sure know that he is starting yet in Alex Orgy. That's one that I look at with a lot of interest uh, one that just got named the starter this week, uh, Tyler Van Dyke at Wisconsin. That's a guy where, you know, I, there's this list from 24-7. We, we love our friends at 24-7. This was from the national guys. But it puts Tyler Van Dyke as the seventh best quarterback in the Big Ten this year. And maybe that's right. I, you know, probably not going to quibble over the number too much. Maybe seems a little high for me. But what I do know is, there's it's been a while since Tyler Van Dyke looked like a guy that you would feel really, really good about. That was probably in 2021, his red shirt freshman year or COVID freshman year. I don't know if it was a red shirt or just a COVID year. It's hard to tell these days, but that's a guy that you look at and you go, uh, it's been a couple years since he's been a guy that you'd feel really good about. So maybe it's in there still. It probably is somewhere. But 
maybe defense has kind of caught on to how he liked to operate and he's just regressed to who he's going to be. I don't know, but I do know that Wisconsin's going to need him to be good. And I also know that the pressure in Wisconsin is probably not as patient with Luke Fickle as it as Nebraska is with Matt Rule right now. I think we talked about this last week, or I might have been talking with somebody about it off air. It's kind of hard to keep track sometimes when you're talking about football pretty much just all the time. But um, I think Wisconsin started in a much better place than Nebraska did when the two respective coaches took over. And so I think the expectations for them to be better faster are pretty heavy. I think they were pretty disappointed last year with how that thing went. And I don't know if Tyler Van Dyke fixes that. I don't know if he is the, uh, you know, is he is he better than, was it Tanner Mordecai last year? I, I don't know. I, you know, Mordecai at least had experience in that type of offense. He at, I believe it was SMU. And was pretty familiar with the concepts and what they were trying to do there. Maybe maybe the change is good for Tyler Van Dyke, but I, I don't look at that as a given. I have a lot of question marks about that situation with, uh, with Wisconsin and their quarterback room. One of the ones I'm most interested in, and not just because I put a ton of stock into the Iowa over, but Cade McNamara is a really, really interesting one. There's been some reports out of camp that it's not going well, uh, which, surprise, surprise, there are reports out of camp that Iowa's offense is bad. But that's a guy that I expect to perform better than Iowa had a quarterback last year. If for some reason he's unable to do that, which I don't even know how you can walk upright and be worse at quarterback than Iowa was last year, but let's pretend that that's a thing that could happen. And if he's worse last year or this year than the combination of him and Deacon Hill were last year, I still feel good about the over the seven and a half because their schedule is cake, but they're definitely going to fall short of 10. And that would, I think would be disappointing for Iowa this year. If I'm Iowa and I don't win 10 games this year, I'd be, I'd be pretty disappointed. I think this is a team that has, I think the defense and the schedule to win 10 games and and that's not a crazy expectation uh coming up next we're gonna stick with big 10 football talk a little purdue with tom deanhart db will be joining us any minute now that's shane producing i'm robbie lula this is hurt at sports radio wrapping up hour number one here on hurt at sports radio am 590 espn omaha espn tri cities that's db i'm robbie lula here on the Pillar Exterior stage, we are joined now by Tom Deanhart. He covers Purdue football for On3. Tom, how are you this morning? Doing pretty good, fellas. Uh, off day today here in West Lafayette. Guy, you get the you get you get those. What are what are off days in the in the fall, Tom? The are where you like? Wow, this is pretty cool. Or is that kind of the way that the schedule's gone so far? It's been busy in camp, Damon. Yeah. As you can imagine. They started July 31st on uh, Wednesday. So yesterday was the two-week, uh, I guess, anniversary, if you will, of camp. They had 12 practices, one scrimmage. And if you ask Ryan Walters, I think the thing he's most happy about is there have been no catastrophic injuries. And I know that's not the case for Nebraska. Let me ask you something with Coach Walters. Uh, like I always say, the first thing that I say about him is, gosh, he, you know, he seems like such a good guy. He's a nice guy. Like, I think he's for the program. And sometimes when you don't talk about acumen or X's and O's or winning, then that can kind of be the death sentence. Am I OK starting with him being a good guy or does that get ratcheted up a little bit in West Lafayette? I think he's a good guy and he's a smart coach. He can check a lot of boxes. He just. You know, inexperience is being a head coach, obviously, Damon. I mean, this guy was born, always blows me away to think about this. He was born in 1986. Mm. <clears throat> I think he was about 37 years old, 38. Uh, just had his first year as a head coach. He's, he's learning on the job at a Big Ten school, so there you go. But um, he's undaunted. You know what youth is like. You can do anything, and I think that that, that, that sort of attitude permeates his staff. It's pretty young staff, guys. Mm. A lot of youth, and they don't think anything can't be accomplished. You need that at a place like Purdue. And um, they've really flipped the roster over. This year alone, there's 37 newcomers. So 
four and eight last year, guys. You know, getting to a bowl this year is going to be tough. We saw their pick to finish last. I think that's really, I really hacked off Walters and everybody. So they're motivated. And I'll tell you what, guys, September 28th, Nebraska at Purdue, the Big Ten opener. And that is a huge game for the Boilermakers. I'm sure for Nebraska, too. Mm. Tom, I, before we get to the newcomers, I did want to stay on Ryan Walters and that young coaching staff for just a second. What are, you know, we talk a lot about players making kind of leaps or improvements from year one to year two. Are there any areas with Ryan Walters and that young coaching staff that you would like to see them make sort of leaps in how they perform from year one to year two? I think it's the one, I think it's one side of the ball. I think it's the defensive side of the ball. <clears throat> Got to get better there. That's Kevin Kane, right? Well, yeah, Kevin Kane. Yeah. Good guy too, man. But that's, and that's, you know, Ryan Walters is a defensive guy, right? He's a defensive, mm-hmm. defensive coordinator at Illinois. That's where he earned his chops and being a defense at Missouri and at Memphis, Arizona, a lot of places. So that's his bailiwick. That's his expertise. Guys, they were last in the Big Ten in points allowed per game last year. The only team to allow over 30 points a game. It was feast or famine. They made a big play or they gave up a big play. They got to get better. They, they got to they got they got to mute the bus and not allow as many bust. And but you know what, guys, it's a high risk, high reward defense. Mm-hmm. They're, they're going to play a lot of man coverage. They're going to come after you. They're basically, a five lineman. They're asking their five linemen to block their five linemen. They like their chances with one on one matchups. Sort of is what it is. And I think if you have a defense like that, your offense has to make up some ground, right, and score some points. But again, the defense has to make strides, like I said, and. and the biggest stride, like I said, is is many big plays this year. Yeah, it's interesting too because it's such a safety rich conference. There are some thoroughbreds across the board, and Dylan has held his own. He, he was the freshman phenom. He 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 runs that deal back there. Who does he need to get help from up front to have a similar sophomore campaign? He's the real deal. Oh yeah. I think he's only going to be here three years, and he could be a first-round draft choice. But Damon, he needs help from 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 number four, Kaidrin Jenkins. Um, Kaidrin Jenkins was a rush in last year. It was number three in the Big Ten in sacks and TFLs. They moved him to inside linebacker. <clears throat> he's going to be able to roam the field. He's still going to rush. He's going to blitz. He's going to line up off the edge on third downs. But he's got to be a stud this year again. Um, that that's the big guy. And there's one other defensive end to watch. Number fifteen. True sophomore named Will Health, six foot six, two hundred sixty-five pounds. He already looks like a pro getting off the bus, and he flashed last year as a true freshman. He looks like he's ready to break out. And guys, they need to start off the edge because if you remember, Nick Scorton, the number one sack man in the Big Ten last year, bolted West Lafayette for Texas A&M. So we do need someone to come off that edge to wreak havoc and get some sacks this year. You talk about feast or famine. You only give up a 54% completion percentage, but like you alluded to, the scoreboard lit up like, you know, uh, uh, like a ping pong game. It's it's incredible how there are sometimes it looks so difficult to get something done, and they play a three three five two, which is why I pay so much attention to them. But what do you, what is the difference between such a low completion percentage and lighting up the scoreboard? I, a lot of times, I think it's just it's, it's, when you're giving up big plays, you're not making opponents earn it. Um, and that's something that I was so good at, right? You guys know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Grindy. Bill Parker. The bend, but don't break. He, he's going to dare you to, do, to execute 10 or 12 plays to score and not make a mistake, not mess it up, not turn it over, not get a penalty to blow a drive. He's going to dare you to do that. A lot of times, offenses can't do it. And then they get that stop. Uh, he's not going to take a lot of chances with, with man coverage and blitzes. He's going to pick his spot to be more judicious about it. So I think that's the biggest difference. So you talk about the completion percentage pretty well last year. Pretty pretty solid number, 54. But, again, uh, you think uh, the points allowed per game maybe would reflect that. But yeah. they don't. Again, get back to teams may have to score too easily on big plays. you got to make people earn stuff. We're talking with Tom Deanhart. He covers Purdue football for On3. Tom? You, you mentioned 37 newcomers. Um, obviously, you've got some returners at key spots like Hudson Carr and Devin Maccabee, but who are some of the newcomers you look at as having to absolutely make an impact this year? Well, there's one guy who's kind of a newcomer in quotes, probably going to be their best receiver. The kid who got here last year blew out a knee in camp and had to miss the entire year. Um, he, he's a Florida Atlantic transfer, Jamal Edron. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, he's supposed to be their alpha wide out of big kid, 6'3", 215. He's going to have to be a stud this year. So that that's one sort of newcomer to watch. They got four kids from Georgia, if you can believe it. All four should help them. And I think um, their best cornerback is going to be one of these Georgia kids, Nylon Green. He, he's going to have to be a shutdown type corner. He looks like a pro physically, you know, 6'2", 200-pound cornerback that can run. Uh, we'll see if he can deliver. They got an end from Georgia named C.J. Madden they like a lot. And uh, a wide receiver, too, well, C.J. Smith, could be their second-best guy, supposed to be the fastest player on the team, quote-unquote Olympic caliber speed. So those Georgia kids got to step up, too. And we'll watch their tight end, uh, Max Clare. He got hurt last year in September, missed the rest of the year. I think he could be special. He could be an All-Big Ten tight end, a big kid, can run. And uh, you know, I think Hudson Carr is going to really look for Max Clare, number 86, on third downs. Yeah, You can't see my surprise face with Purdue in a good tight end. I'm shocked. I, uh, you're right, though. I'll be curious to see Coach Carter, Sam Carter, who's got your corners with some new talent back there on the edges. But – let me get to the guy that's come up a couple times, Hudson Card. What's the relationship and where do you think it goes with Graham Harrell and Hudson Card, who a lot of people, there was some murmurs last year that some felt like he may be the best get of the all the new quarterbacks mm. in mm. in new places last year with another year under his belt with Graham Harrell. That's the big key right there, another year under his belt under Graham Harrell. And that's what people are are banking on that year of experience, that one year under his belt in the offense, in the system with Coach Harrell. It's just natural progression, right? You're going to get better logically, you think, the longer you're in a system. And this this is Hudson Card's last year. The hope is that comfort level is higher now. And uh, he was solid last year. I'll be honest, he wasn't great. He was solid. Uh, he didn't really benefit from a strong line. He was under a lot of duress. I mean, he was hurt, guys. He had to use injury as, as an excuse, but he played banged up about half the year, at least five games. Almost didn't play at Iowa. Missed the game at Northwestern. So I think that contributed maybe some of his uh, of his performances last year. But he's got to be a stud. You know, that always goes without saying, right? That's obvious. Your mom knows quarterbacks have to play well if you want to have a good team. And Hey, guys, look at the Big Ten quarterbacks. I know there's 18 teams this year. But on the surface, it doesn't look like it's a laundry list of studs, right? Yeah. Mm. I think Dylan Gabriel leads the way. We'll see how good the kid at Penn State is. You know, you got you got the true freshman there. But to just think in your head, Tyler Van Dyke, the Kansas State kid, Ohio State, Maryland's got a new guy. Rutgers has got the kid from Minnesota. So um, my point is Hudson Card, I think it's fair to say, could be one of the top five quarterbacks in the Big Ten if I'm one of the top three quarterbacks. And again, they're going to need it because when you get a chance, if you get bored, look at Purdue's schedule this year. I, I don't think you'll find any team with a tougher schedule in the Big Ten. Tom, just about 90 seconds left. Maccabee's coming out party was against Nebraska, I think, a year and a half ago. A lot of things were expected of him last year with the new body type. And it didn't re- – I mean, I, it, there's – listen, I'm, I'm giving it time because running backs need help with the offensive line. But how critical is he to what this offense wants to do considering he's shown flashes? Big. Hey, if you want to surprise yourself, Purdue led the Big Ten in rushing yep. in conference games and finished number three <laughs> overall. So they could run the ball. Mockaby was solid. He was kind of banged up last year. Is that what it was? He's gotten, and you know, he, he, he's gotten big. We talked to him the other day. He can, he, he's noticed to be a little bit thicker. He's up to two hundred. So, the, so he's the old Mockaby now. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't look. He doesn't, man, if you saw Devin Mockaby, you think he's just a student, right? He doesn't have any. <laughs> He does not have. He does not have a Damon Benny body. Oh, shit. <laughs> neither, neither does DB. <laughs> so, uh, he, you know, he's, he's a great kid. He, he's, he's sort of unmoved by all this. You would not know he's a star. He really doesn't care. He's a star. He loves to work on his hot rod cars. He fixes his players' cars. He's a big gearhead. Rides a little BMX bicycle around. But just, just a real, real, real fresh breath of fresh air, if you will. And uh, just the most unlikely start. A fun story. Walk on. Now he has a chance to lose there, guys. Maybe he's one of, well, obviously one of the top rushers ever. And guys, he's going to try to be the first thousand yard rusher of Purdue since. Get this 2008. Mm. Or he I don't think there's any team, FBS team, that catches a longer drought without a thousand yard rusher than Purdue. 2008 was the last time Purdue had a thousand yard rusher. I still had a full head of hair back in 2008. That's a long <laughs> That's Tom Dean Hart. He covers Purdue football for all three. Tom, we appreciate the time. I'm sure we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, TD. Thank you, fellas. We got more Herd at Sports Radio coming up next. Kicking off hour number two here on Herd at Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here on the Pillar 
exterior stage and reminding you that if you're out driving and getting your way to work, make sure you wear your seatbelts. It prevents injuries and saves lives, but only if you wear it properly. Make it click. This message from the NDOT Highway Safety Office. DB, what's up? I'm just trying to make it. You trying to make it another day? Yeah, just a day. Yeah, I am. I'm going to practice out of the way. Man, my voice. Like, I say, you must have got after it today. No, well, I got to get used to it again. Yeah, right? like condition it. Yep, and I, you know, I got to get back to the basics with my Ricolas and honey and all that. That's something it. not a lot of people think about when yeah. you're coaching. Yeah. Is that nah. first week or two back, nah, nah, the, uh, I wasn't a big yeller, but even for me, it, uh, it was a little... I was more just like quietly sharing my disappointment, mm. but <laughs> hey, how uh, that quarterback? Do you am I misremembering? Didn't people love the Hudson they card did. to with Graham Merrill? Yes, that was a real thing last year. Yeah, that was one they thought. I think most a lot of people thought it was the best fit between coordinator and new quarterback. And I, you know, they tried to run the ball a little bit more than than I think Purdue mm-hmm. than I think people thought. I mean, but you know, my I think Ma could be rushed for. 800-ish, oh, 800, 860. You know, about, about four and a half a carry. Yeah. But remember going in, it was like, ooh, Maccabee could be, you know, he had the new body and he was kind of fit. Yeah. Because remember when he diced Nebraska up in West Lafayette two he years ago. with a couple C's. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, how is this guy pulling this off? Yeah, he was a big dude. And then he was you running know, away from people. And, and Tracy got carries last year for them. Um, I think he let, he was second in carries and, yeah. and guard had the next most. So. They're complimenting of the run game. Mm-hmm. I, I still think, and not to go back to the PBC Pinnacle Bank Championship, but I, I still was a little surprised that you would be okay, more okay, mm. with a loss at home to Rutgers than a loss on the road to Purdue. Okay. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. I'm still okay with it. Yeah, first roadie, maybe dealing with success. I get it. I mean, I would get it. If you if you get off to a good start. Yeah, if they start off 4-0. I get it. I get how it could happen. I just think Rutgers is going to be better this year. And I haven't got... But sometimes, but sometimes it's not about that. Sometimes it's about where you catch somebody in the No, schedule. but I mean, for me, about how I would feel about the loss. Yeah. I would feel better about Rutgers because I think they're going to be better. Not that I think it's more likely or so, less so likely. So, like, at first blush, if I said, oh, man, Nebraska lost to Purdue on the road. Versus, hey, man, Nebraska lost to Rutgers at home. I mean, full disclosure, it's going to depend on how each of those teams ends up being at the end of the season. Like, if I'm looking back at it, for me, it's going to depend on how they how those teams. So if, you know. That is it, such a safe way to play it. No, it, that's just how I feel, though. Like, because, I mean, like, the Colorado is a great example of this, both against Nebraska last year yeah, but, and TCU. And I don't want to shoot down the theory. Go ahead. Go ahead. You well, I was just going to say, so. The Colorado TCU game felt like a huge win for Colorado in the moment mm-hmm. because TCU played in the national championship game the the, the year before, right? Mm-hmm. We knew they were going to be worse. We didn't know what they were going to be, though. By the end of the season, you look at it, you're like, eh, it's, you know, it's nice to win your first game of the Dion era, whatever. But you look at it, it was an exciting game. But you look at it, you go, that's not really a great win. Yeah, but in the same vein. Yeah. Colorado's a vastly different team in week 10 than they are in week two. 100%. So, like. I get it. I. I I'm just a big stay in the moment guy because injuries happen, morale happens. Mm-hmm. Like it's just it's different. I I, I think so. It, it is for sure. And, and my I guess my point was in this discussion last week and, and kind of continuing is if I'm looking at big picture and I'm I'm getting eight and four because this is where this started right is they gar- we were guaranteed Citrus Bowl and eight and four yeah. right. I, I did like the fact that Tony bailed you out because he said it real succinctly. He was like. I think Ravi's trying to explain eight wins and how you get there and ha- not have it look ugly. Yes. Otherwise, 100%. it has you have to be talking about nine and three. Yeah. And I was like, got it. 100%. Yeah. There's only. Well, thank, tip your cap to TG. Say thanks, Tony. I appreciate you, Tony. He's good looking. Up. Um, he always has your back. Now, last two months, man, this dude is like <laughs> the, they're, filling in all the Ravi blanks. In order to get to eight and four and not have an extended losing streak at the end of the season, which is what I'm trying to avoid. Yeah. No, I hear you. You have to lose either Purdue or Rutgers. Yeah. Right, yeah. you can't you can't go seven and zero, and then lose four of your last five and be like, I feel great about eight and four, right? Because you wouldn't. We've sort of been there before in a similar spot with Riley, where they start seven and zero, you lose three of your last five, and you don't feel great about it. We we so it's like we have moved on past that season, and that was like Nebraska's last. It was their last bowl game. It was their last decent season, right? It was. 
I mean, they were top 10 ranked in the country. And we were miserable the week because we we just felt the whole way through it was fool's gold. Yeah. But guess what? I would love some fool's gold right now. Yeah. I'd be thrilled with 7-0 fool's gold, but I won't be thrilled losing four of the last five if that's how it plays out, right? So that's all it is for me. Would I be... Like and and we're talking degrees of separation here. Yeah, I'm not th- I'm not going to be thrilled with a Rutgers loss and devastated by a Purdue loss, right? Just top of like if I think Rutgers is better than Purdue, which I do, I'd rather lose to the better team. Yeah, and Nebraska hasn't gotten so good at home yet that I'm like, oh, they can't lose a home. You know what I mean? Like they haven't defended their home turf well enough that I'm like they can't lose a home I'm, game. Yeah, but I'm just telling you though, you 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 stub your toe at home to Rutgers and Nebraska isn't where they need to be. Right, because Rutgers will be in a similar vein. They they will. They will they will they will look and I hadn't even done the defensive statistics, mm-hmm. but we heard when we did our Rutgers preview, yeah, you know, their play by play guy was like, Listen, man, they don't they don't turn teams over enough. Mm-hmm. Gotta get off the field on third down. You know, uh, and I'm like, they don't get after the quarterback enough. And I'm like, but they're still good defensively. I'm like, Oh, that's Who's Nebraska. That like? That's Nebraska. Yeah. Right, like that. Those are all the things that Nebraska is working on. So I, I, I just think if we're having the kind of season from a projection standpoint that you want to have, that I want to have, that Nebraska has to win those games at home. They just do. Coin flip games at home have to be won by Nebraska. Otherwise, these conversations, it's like because if we can't win those games on the road, I can't begin to get my mind around pulling off an upset on the road. Yeah, which at some point you're going to have to be able to do too. So, right when I look at the, the 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 quarterback play within the conference, I think that's where you have to start. Like, is Calic Manis? Mm. Calic is is all of a sudden that he's going to be the answer? They say he's an upgrade from Whitsitt. Okay, we'll see. Yeah, right. I have no idea what's going on in Iowa. I listen to any sort of media availability they have. I'm I'm trying to find it online. I'm mm-hmm. going to my either Kakert or or Dockerman or somebody. Like they they haven't even remotely tipped their hand at a starting quarterback yet. It's been very reluctant. I would not assume McNamara. that it's McNamara just yet. Um, go to some of the few things we have heard out of Iowa is that it's not going great for McNamara. Yeah. I mean, if I'm if, am. Is Van Dyke, is he going to have is he what, we, than Mordecai? what we couldn't get out of Jeff Sims? We're a guy that's had a propensity to turn the ball over. Mm-hmm. Is he all of a sudden not going to turn the ball over? Sure. Do, right? Yeah, like, that's, like, like that's that's what you're hoping And that's a guy that hasn't about. really been who you kind of thought he would be since 2021. Yeah. What, yeah. What, what, what will Ohio State's offense look like if they don't settle in and they play two guys? Because for all intents and purposes, mm-hmm. I think they're playing two guys. Yeah. Day doesn't say what he said the other day about Julian Sands without yeah. that being like, okay. Like, there may be something to that. So and I haven't really been sold on the Will Howard thing since it happened. No, I know. I get it. Like, but, but. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt to the the relationship between OCs, and if, if it's plural, yeah, right, because Day is heavy handed offensively, but 100%. he does have a ton of respect for for Chip for Chip, yeah. But Howard is a Chip Kelly kind of guy, yes. So I'm going to give that the benefit of the doubt. UCLA ran the ball pretty well, Chip's mm-hmm. last couple of years quietly mm-hmm. at UCLA, better than I think. Yeah, like with DTR. And yeah, man, like yeah. they ran the ball. Yeah. They were a physical team. That's and, the thing and, that they never got credit for when he was at Oregon is they were a pretty physical football team. So I, I just look at the quarterback situations around the – and Nebraska is going to play a young guy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, it's just a lot of a lot of unknowns, the Ohio, at least for me. The Ohio State one really intrigues me because I – mean, Do you really know how they're going to play at SC? No. No, not very good sample size. No. And they got a big one early. And, like, I, I think at some point, you know, I know they changed defensive coordinators and all that. And, like, at some point, does Lincoln Riley ever ask himself, is, like, am I part of the problem here? Why would he ask himself that? On the defensive side of the ball? <sighs> Ooh, I don't know about that. Okay. I don't know. I mean, maybe. Like, do you just – do you even ask the question? Because it's been so bad – Mm. pretty consistent like the defense have been pretty consistently struggling with Lincoln Riley I mean I guess it's kind of I I think I kind of have the cheat code because I talked to coach White about the courting Mm -hmm. 
at SC. And so I think I know what Lincoln Riley wants. Okay. Now it is up to him to make it happen, but I don't think he's a guy that's like, just get the ball back from my offense. Okay. That's fair. You know, that's what I mean? the you know what I mean? I think of him. Yeah. But I, I don't, I don't think it's like that. Unless there was just such reverence for White and wanting him to be in SoCal that you that he was pitching him, you say things that you don't really mean, which, which I don't. Wouldn't be the first time, and yeah, I'm gonna when give, you're I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt That's there, fine. right? I, I don't have any reason not to, and I don't have enough conviction to be like, "Hey, man, I'm right." Like I, I'm yeah. just going by the feel of the conversation. Totally fair. So. Because I think the perception of Lincoln Riley is a but I do just think give me the ball back. I, I do think D apostrophe Lynn is legit is an upgrade. Yeah, you know, and you start looking at, I mean, look at the coordinators in this conference, the mm-hmm. defensive coordinators in this conference. I mean, it's it's a it's a big boy league. Oh, 100 percent. So, I think you you better be able to play. You better be able to play good defense. I mean, I think there's pressure on Tosh. In Oregon. Yeah. Oh, I do. Because the repetitiveness of, of, of physicality, we, you can't simulate that. Mm-hmm. You just have to train in such a way where time doesn't matter. Yeah. Right. Because it's not like. It's one thing to be a physical team in a not physical conference. It's another team to be. It's yeah. If there's only be, three physical. If there's only yeah. Oregon State, Utah, and Oregon. Yeah. Right. That play that way at the line of scrimmage. Three. three. You can kind of take. Yeah, if it's not if, weeks off, but if but you if get the, breaks, if the bulks of the team that you play yeah. play in the trenches if like you're that, going it's, Iowa, and Wisconsin, they don't, yeah, they don't even have to be Michigan. spectacular. It's just rigor. Yeah, it's it's just you, you don't you don't understand how to push the rigor until you go through it's rigor. Just a beat it, right? <laughs> right. It's like, not. So I I hope there's something to that because I think that's the biggest thing that Nebraska learned under this new staff last year was, mm-hmm. hey man, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Right, we don't want to be limping to the finish line. We want to be fresh mm-hmm. because it is a big boy league. You playing Iowa at the end of the year at six thirty in Iowa City, not for you, everyone. You already know what type of party that is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But what you're not afforded the luxury to do is to fast forward and be like, "Hey, man, I just got to get through these first eleven games." Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Doesn't work like that in this league. No, you can do that. In and, other and, and so, and so, I think coaches have to they. Like you have to, you have to negotiate yeah. that with depth. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're Oregon, you've got. I mean, one that people don't think about, like Illinois beats on you. Mm-hmm. Like Illinois is a physical uh, yeah. gap scheme, G scheme. Like th- you watch their run game. Yeah, you have to be prepared to play that a certain way. Yeah, they are, and and, and Bielema, that like he's one of the best in the business at teaching it. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna beat your head in. They've got Oregon's got Oregon State again this year. I mean, do we like what's going on in, in Illinois with the quarterback? Like, the quarterback spot in the Big Ten is very, very interesting. Yeah, I, I agree. There's And I'm not totally sold on Dylan Gabriel either. Like, the numbers, we said this off air a little bit, the numbers are going to be there. Yeah, and I'm I'm already on record with, I, I like Gabriel, I don't love Gabriel. And, and that's like, getting inside the numbers. Yeah. Like, he did the bulk of his work last year. I think he... I'm I'm misremembering. I do know against the two top twenty defenses that he played, the two best teams they played uh, at the time, Kansas and Okie State. He was one touchdown, two picks. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was weird because he still completed seventy four percent of his passes, but it wasn't productive. Yeah. in terms of generating points. So I'm, I mean, I don't know. I, I you know he threw sixteen of his thirty touchdowns in in five games. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I don't know. I the ability to play catch vertically in this league in crucial moments is going to separate teams that are looking at the the twelve team playoff and not. I'm not talking about playing pitch and catch on RPOs, mm-hmm. right? I, I'm not talking about tunnel screens and speed outs, mm-hmm. right? Those are great. Like, I, but you're talking about like third and eight. Yeah, I'm talking third and eight, hitting a skinny, mm-hmm. or or completing an over route on like a third and twelve, where you got to quell the crowd and, and you uh, have to convert. Right, like those are the things that I'm talking about that I think are the difference. Where you're like, hey, I have to pick up a first down right now, and I can't yeah. count on a missed tackle. Didn't 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 matter how some of these like Stetson Bennett for all the hand wringing we did over what JJ McCarthy wasn't. At third third nine, man, dude made plays mm-hmm. right, and then all of a sudden you realize that Roman Wilson was on your team. Yeah. 
or Loveland was a really, really good tight end. Mm -hmm. So those are the guys that when you get in meaningful games late in October and early November, and it ain't third and four RPOs when it's cute and fun and, you know, first and 10 when you got a two-way go. I'm talking about third and nine nut cutting time. Mm -hmm. Those are the guys. And I don't know if there's a ton of proven commodities. I mean, do I – like right now you ask me, do I trust Van Dyke in third and nine? No. Yeah, and you know, on a do I trust s- Saturday night in, in Madison when Nebraska's there? Do I trust Drew Aller? Another guy whose numbers like wouldn't you think Penn State we'd have a different count if a guy goes twenty six and two. You think we were having different conversations think, about but, Penn State? Yeah, prolific offense. But yeah. people still say, ah, I don't know about Drew. That's because people watched it. <laughs> right. But so <laughs> you know my, what I mean? well, so my point is, but I would be tickled with twenty six and two. Oh, without a doubt. But Penn State goals and Nebraska goals right now are not in the same. We're we're not we're having different conversations. Yeah, I, I know. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's incredible the the scrutiny that that Penn State gets. Oh, because right now, I mean, but, but, Penn State's winning ten games a year, basically. That's the average. Yeah, but that we did again when you're in the preseason top ten, mm-hmm. as much as they are, and I think the last eight years it's been five, five or six, maybe. Mm-hmm. Like a lot is expected of you, hundred percent, right? But they have won back to back years of seven games in the conference. It's just that those two L's were the two that they needed the most. So, so Ohio State and Michigan. So, so yes, twenty six and two for them is probably like, man, where were we on like third and nine yeah. with our back against the wall on the twenty two yard line or something like that? Twenty six and two is like, where did that get us? Where yeah. did twenty six yeah. and two get us? So I, I understand that fully, but. Whereas, like, if Dylan Rayola goes twenty six and two, Nebraska one hundred percent gets to their eight wins, probably nine. Yeah, and we're having a totally different conversation. Like, the end games are different. If if, Nebra- so, if Nebraska doesn't turn the ball over and they're generating twenty six touchdowns via the pass, yeah, they're they're fine. <laughs> they're gonna be absolutely. <laughs> they're, but it's just weird how you know, like, it's a school like Penn State can't say that. Yeah, no, it's, it's mind boggling. Which is why the game is more than just stats. Yes, one, it's. Uh, again, the, just the context of what is needed at Penn State this year versus what is needed at Nebraska this year is is pretty dramatically different. But y- your point about the quarterbacks, I guess Tom was making this point as well, it is, you know, so the top 24-7 put out a list uh, a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, top quarterbacks. Uh, quarterbacks. Yeah, I, I saw that. Number one was Gabriel. We both, again, the numbers are going to be there. Is he going to be the That's guy fine. you need him to be? Let's right? put him on, yeah. Number two is Drew Aller. We just had a conversation about Drew Aller. The numbers are going to be there. Is he going to be who you need him to be? Here's a here's a better way to look at that. Yeah. Are Penn State fans, do you think, championing that? Excited that? Uh, yeah. Or do you think Penn State fans would make an argument that he's won? Maybe that's well, the better question. I don't think so. I don't either. I don't think so. That's my point I, though, I, about I, Aller. I, I think with Drew, I think they're thinking, I think the natural inclination, him, you know, maybe we got to pull enough PSU fans. I think they're thinking. I think the first thing that they would say is, "Yeah, but." Yeah, I do. I, I agree. I think they'd say, "Yeah, but." That's the deal with Aller, which is that's your guy at number two, and I he probably is. That's number, fine. No, but he probably is number two. But that goes to your point about the quarterback play in the conference, maybe not being as rock solid as some of the names would indicate. Because mm-hmm. you go from Dylan Gabriel, who we both have our hesitations on, to Drew Aller, who I think I agree, Penn State fans would go, "Yeah, but" with, and then you go Will Howard. Who we've had this conversation about already. Who where, may not be the full time starter. Yeah, may not may not be the full time starter. I do think the amount that Will Howard plays will tell you who has more control of that offense. If Will Howard is I don't know, man. More full time starter. If Julian than is not, that I'm pretty you know, remember, Kelly's coach Mariota. He it ain't like he needs a certain kind of guy. He's I had know. he's had dynamic dudes. So I, I don't I don't agree with that at all. I, I think I think they want to win games and there's a lot of pressure. So I think the guy that gives them the best chance to win, it, it is my opinion. I, yeah. I, I think they're playing that guy. I don't think it tells me anything about control except for we got big games to win and we're going with the guy that does that. The reason as, that and right on cue. The reason I say that is I think this is my judgment. I don't have any reason, I don't have any information on this. My judgment would be, okay, if you've got Ryan Day, who's tended to play quarterbacks in a certain way, you've got Chip Kelly, who's had some versatile different guys, but plays a lot more running quarterbacks. Each of those guys probably thinks the guy that does their thing best gives them the best chance to win. So it's not like, oh, I want to play Will Howard, even though I think Julian Sane gives us the best chance to win. It's 
I want to play Will Howard because I think my version of this offense gives us the best chance. To yeah, win. I, I just to win, I think right? we're overthinking it. Like Julian Sand could play his version. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, but I like mean, that's that's possible. And then if he can, then yeah, that Julian Sand probably ends up being the yeah. guy. Um, and then you go, you, you I don't want to say you fall off a cliff, but number four is Miller Moss, who's played like no football. Like, you get two guys with... Highly, highly touted. And sure. the last time we saw him, it was... It was great. Whew. But it's it's one football game. I do. Football, football. But, so I want to take myself back to that moment. Okay. When Miller Moss was getting a start in that bowl game and Caleb Williams wasn't playing, what did we say? Uh, that oh, USC wouldn't how, have a chance. Yep. Let's see Caleb how they Williams let's was, see how, let's see how they do now without the guy that saved their bacon all year. Because yeah, that's pretty much what we said. Yeah, right. And I think it's for an a ex- lot of the it's, year it, was it's an extremely quarterback. Like he saved their bacon a ton. Mm-hmm. So I think we have to give the devil his due, right? Because we said that going in, and then we watched it and we're like, oh fudge, mm-hmm. and it looked like they really skipped the beat. Yeah. So I, I I I think we got to keep that right there. That's fair. It, it, you know what I mean? It's That's easy. a fair thing to bring up because he's because right I think talent wise, like he's. I also a talent. He can spin it now. Have a hard time knowing what to do with bowl games in yeah, terms. Of, and now if you'd you'd been like, hey, man, DB like one game sample size. Eh. That's high in this conference relative to how I think how good I think the conference could be. Because that's really what you're saying without saying it. Yeah. You're like, how is Moss this high? And he's only played one game when the conference could be this good. Right? Like, yeah. I mean, if you're <laughs> come on, come on other quarterbacks. Yeah. If you're <laughs> expecting to have four teams in the playoff, Miller Moss on a team that we don't expect to make the playoff probably can't be the fourth best quarterback in the league. That's, I, now that I, I'm, I could understand that, that rationale. Like, Cause that, I would probably say not to, well, because he would say it makes it right. But that's how I would think about it. Yeah. I'm like, that's awful high for a team that may not make the kind of run that they're making. Yeah. And I don't, I, I don't think most people do expect them to be making the run in terms of playoff. Well, like something, I mean, except for our guys that, yeah, I was going to say, analytical. you know, uh, Dave and, and Adam. Adam could be beating their chest about their models because they love SC. Yeah. The models love SC for sure. But then you like, that's what I mean, though. After those first three guys, it's like, okay, proven production, proven production, proven production, even if you've got some yeah buts about it, and you've got one game sample size. And Van Dyke was seven, right? Van Dyke was seven. Will Rogers is five. Who That's a guy with a ton of production at Mississippi State. Kind of a weird year last year yeah. with the change in coaching and everything like that with Leach and, and everything happening there. So you wonder, okay, can he be the guy he was the first three years at Mississippi State? Is last year the real guy? That's going to be an interesting one, too. Like, there's a lot of yeah buts. Because number six, our guy, Dylan Rayola. I probably would put Card ahead of Rodgers. You think so? Well, year two with Graham. Rodgers had a lot of production, though. Oh, I know. Man, that's interesting. Uh, we will continue this Big Ten quarterback first, first discussion blush. coming up. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. You're listening to Herd Out Sports Radio. Halfway through the show here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, <laughs> ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. We're live on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula, live here at the Herd at Sports Bar and Grill, where you can come actually hang out with us in a couple weeks. On Friday before the UTEP game, uh, we will be having our live pregame breakfast presented by Ep Foundation Repair. Make sure you reserve your seat at Eventbrite. Just search for Herd at Sports Radio at eventbrite.com and reserve your seat. We've got breakfast. We'll have drinks here as well. Uh, which you'll just pay for your breakfast once you get here. But make sure you get signed up. We'll be doing four of these throughout the year, and uh, it'll be great to have live shows back here at Herdat Sports Bar and Grill. That's how T. Mose feels about Lincoln Riley. <laughs> well, he's an Oklahoma fan, so that's... Uh, you like how he minced words? I think that's the general consensus of Oklahoma fans. See, and he's in a precarious spot because I still... I'm, I mean, I didn't mean to like make this up if it wasn't a thing at Big Ten Media Days, but I think people treated him like kind of a hostile witness. It wasn't as much as delivery as as much as I feel like he can't shake the dodging of the SEC rep. Yeah. So I think he has to win yeah. in this conference. I think that is a thing that people think about him with you a lot. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so. <clears throat> 
I, I did want to get back to the quarterbacks here because you said something on the way out that you thought you would take Hudson Card over Will Rogers. I think. I I struggle with that I, I, a little I, bit. Well, I probably know why. You like Rogers productive productivity. Yeah, super productive. Yeah. But especially before last year. He only played eight games last year. Wasn't bad, but wasn't what he'd been the previous years. And Hudson Card just doesn't have that much of it. Mm-hmm. Now, if you want to make the argument of you have a better idea of or you think you have a better idea of what Graham Harrell looks like with Hudson Card in year two of that offense, and you know how those offensive offenses have looked with Graham Harrell in the past. Like I could make that argument. I just have a really hard time overlooking a ton of productivity from Will Rogers. Yeah, the thing about it is, is I look at the situation he's in too, mm-hmm. right? And I don't know what to make of Washington again. Really. Year two with Harrell and Card. I'm not. I mean, color me curious. Yeah. I you know, think that's they, fair. They, 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 in, in totality, they ran the ball as a group better than mm-hmm. I think most thought they would. And Card had, like, I mean, I get some of it as scrambles, but like 93 rushing attempts. I'm, I'm almost positive he was second on their team in rush attempts ahead of Tracy. So I, I just look at that situation. Now we'll see. I mean, Fish is. Fish has been pretty good with quarterbacks. Yeah. And. Obviously, Will Rogers is a guy that's got a ton of experience. I mean, he wasn't like electric last year. No, last year he—I mean, last year was not a great year for him. But I mean, the two years before that, he goes thirty-six touchdowns, nine picks; thirty-five touchdowns, eight picks. You know, forty-seven hundred yards, thirty-nine hundred yards. Like he was highly, highly productive his last two years mm-hmm. under Leach before getting switched, and then he only played eight games last year. But a lot of quarterbacks are highly, highly, highly productive. That they under, are under leads. That's fair. They they really are. Um, I don't know. I just have I have a hard time. But you know, it's not like I know I'm splitting hairs. Well, and it's not like Harrell and Leach run totally different. I mean, Rayola at six is high. Yeah, I mean right? they're projecting. So it's ta- yeah, it's a, it's about the it's a proje- projection of talent, which is why you can go Miller Moss at four. Yeah. Which, if like you said this off the air, I think if Miller Moss ends up being at four, you think USC ends up being S- pretty SC's good. SC's pretty good. Now, I, you could make the argument. That, that it's just an offensive thing? Well, yeah, because, I mean, Caleb Williams would have been one last year. and SC wasn't good. SC wasn't very good, yeah. right? So well, I understand. Um, I, do, I do think it dramatic. But, but, but I think. You're making the assumption that the defense with Lynn and the new pieces is better than last and year. And in a different offensive kind of conference. Yes. Right. Like their schedule is fairly friendly year one. Yeah, especially late. They don't have to play any cold games. Yeah, late. no, it's that this doesn't get grimy late where I felt like it attrition certainly could have. I mean, speaking of Oklahoma, that's why I wanted to go over Oklahoma's schedule with Brian Edwards. Yeah. Which I mean we'll be, do here in the next segment. You know, because it's like I mean, sandwiched in between weeks, you're like it's like Tennessee, then Auburn, and then I don't know, Missouri or somebody else good. It's like I don't like it. It's it's <laughs> different than being in the Big Twelve. Yeah. And you could be as good or better of a team than you were a year ago. And lose more games. Yeah. Like yeah. so they I'm go telling, like attrition and rigor is a real thing. Look at the stretch after Tulane. Yeah, so after Tulane, so that's their Tulane's their third game of the season. They go Tennessee at home, at Auburn, Texas, South Carolina. At Ole Miss, and then they get a break with Maine. I mean, come on, man. And then they go at Missouri, Alabama. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? So you got one, two. What are we talking three, about? Three, um, four. That's, that's a good question. You've got minimum of five teams that have playoff aspirations. Uh, it's just like, and it's bang, that have bang, real bang, playoff bang, aspirations, bang, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just it's just relentless. The, just the degree of physicality that you have to play with in the trenches. Like at Auburn is your is your rest week. Yeah, like that's your break. Yeah, is at Auburn and then South Carol at Auburn and then South Carolina at home are your rest weeks, which maybe South Carolina at home is a little bit more of one, but you're talking about going, you know, four out of five weeks where you're you're having a tough go of things. Yeah. That's that'll be interesting to see how how Brian looks at that one. And sometimes it doesn't have anything to do with record. I, I mean, the last couple of years, like you know, Coach Petito mm-hmm. didn't yield a ton of wins, but there was a certain level of physicality that they were going to play with. So, oh, like, yeah. if you're playing, if you're playing North Miller North Miller West in succession, 
that's a rough stretch for you. Well, the last thing we're thinking about is how many wins does each team have? It's like, <laughs> I mean, you're not going to be in a ton of spread <laughs> playing yeah. nickel. You're playing in a phone. Right. Game. You're going to see pinning. You're going to see pulling. You're yeah. going to see, I mean, like it's just, it just, that, those kinds of things matter. Yeah. And that's going to be in an entirely different experience. Kind of like we were talking about with Oregon. It's going to be an entirely different experience for Oklahoma. Right. Like playing, you, you saw the, the, the crazy record of teams that played Navy after they played Navy. Oh, yeah. It's it's dumb. And it's not like Navy was lighting the world on fire. It's just there's just certain way teams play that it's and it's not just the style, right? It's not just like, oh yeah, the style throws you off free. It's like, no, they're just banging their head against yeah. you for four hours on a Saturday. Yeah. Interior play I don't know. Is I'm there anything to it like of uh I know you talk about like rigor a lot, but like and, and a lot of that's physical, right? But especially I guess specifically when you're playing a team like Navy where you're like eye discipline and stuff has to be so good. Mm -hmm. How much of that is like a mental rigor also? It's it's exhausting. Um, you know, I, I'm a big no ball guy, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, practice and defense without playing. Yeah, get, 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 get your eyes out of the back, especially like in our inside run period. Mm -hmm. I mean, we draw our cards up. It's precise. Hey, you, you pin, you pull, you do this, you do that. doesn't matter. Read your keys. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't even do it with backs. Mm. Right. But I, we'll have seven guys at some point blocking, yeah. whether they're perimeter guys or O-line. I say that to just say, like, there's a style in which you have to play. Mm -hmm. Especially, you see different running styles. Like, Illinois would not, or Minnesota. See, those wouldn't be fun teams to play back-to-back. Mm -hmm. -back, no. Even though the record won't, does, won't be gaudy. Yeah, it doesn't like mm -hmm. lend itself to like, oh man, they're playing good teams. And people discount that. Mm. Like fans just well, they weren't very good. It didn't mean it wasn't a physical game. Yeah, it doesn't mean it was wasn't hard. Yeah. Like you know, I I saw you know, Mike Farrell was like, hey, early upset this season. Like, call it. Mm -hmm. I have one in my head. I think Georgia Tech will be much tougher on Florida State. Mm. Yeah. Than I think the experts are going to think because of the way that Georgia Tech runs the football yeah they, they the quarterback run game the the way that they block like it's gonna be a nice little matchup on the interior and it's the first one for yeah it'll, FSU, it'll be right? a good it'll be a good do you, would you rather play that team first off the bat g tech yeah or you want it like third game of the season when you build up a little bit of a lather because you certainly uh, don't want them late right yeah, I'd try to get them out of the way early. Yeah. Like, you're not trying to play them game 11. Yeah. <laughs> and there are teams like that. So we talk about that on our schedule all the time. Yeah. Uh, if you don't get them, get them early, not yeah. late. Right. 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 Yeah. You don't want to, when you're already sort of a mash unit, you're yeah, not I trying would, to. I would want to play us early. Yeah. Right. Now, last year, not so much. Yeah. I this year, I would rather. I would rather. there was a good time to play Yeah, because you if you year. played us later last year, I mean, you have a chance for maybe injuries to pile up. Or, yeah. Or yeah. something like that. Like. But anyway, I just like those schedules and when you play teams, it's just like Nebraska finally getting a bye team coming off a bye, coming off a bye, right? It's like yeah. sometimes you just you don't want a team coming off a bye when you play four straight. Yeah. The That's record just, may not be gaudy, right. but there's a practicality to yeah, it. Yeah, that, that kind of stuff matters. Mm. Coming up next, we're going to talk to our guy Brian Edwards. We'll get into that Oklahoma schedule as well as a couple other teams. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. Wrapping up hour number two here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula. We're joined now by Brian Edwards, our Vegas insider from Major.com. What's up, B? What's happening, fellas? How we doing? What's up, Mr. Justin? Are we, are we, we, we ready for UFC this weekend? No, not quite. I mean, I mean I'm fired up for it I, but in terms of picks I, I got a lot of studying to do i want to watch uh i haven't even watched any of the pressers from media day it's uh, a chunky yes. it's a chunky card too yeah i mean i i, I want to see adesanya and duplessis face to face and i want to see who looks like they've got the fire in their eyes because i mean on one hand you know, Adesanya was a very active champion. You know, he, he was more active than most of the champs yeah. are. And, you know, he had the two monster fights with his nemesis, Pereira, Pereira and 
And then Strickland, like, if you just, you know, that was just like, if it was football, you could just totally see where that's uh, a flat spot, if you will, or, you know, just one you could overlook because he's so much better than Strickland, I think. But that night, he did not have it. So the question is, does he still have it? Or was that just a little letdown, you know, situation? And he is 35. Does he still have that hunger? Whereas Duplessis, you know, um, he is the one who's just absolutely on fire and has been running through everybody and what he did to Whitaker. I mean, so it's a, I, now, I mean, I just well, don't know. Allegedly, don't know. if you believe this, this is the healthiest Adesanya has been in years. Ah, uh, yeah, we, we get that a lot during fight week. <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> no, right, allegedly. so, yeah, I don't. I, I don't know. So we'll see. But the one fight I do like, I, I do like Ty Tuivasa at plus 185. Look, I know he's lost four in a row, but but look who he's lost to. Three of those guys were top five, gone, Pavlovich, and Volkov. Volkov's actually number three right now. The only one I was surprised by, I, I think he's better than Tabora. Uh, but, but the first two that, were not talent, wise, talent wise, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I thought he's better than Tabora, but he lost that one. But the last two losses were – submissions he didn't get his bell wrong and knocked out like he did against Pavlovic and gone but both of those were in 2022 and let's remember he won five fights in a row before that whereas you know uh Rosenstrike is getting up there in age he's 36 Tuivas is 31 and Rosenstrike's only two and three in his last five fights and the two guys he beat were unranked so uh, I'm gonna go with Bam Bam to get back in the win column as a plus 185 dog at Bet MGM. All right, let's start with uh, our schedules and th th their schedule sucks. The the big the SEC did them no favors. Let's talk Oklahoma and win totals here. This schedule it looks miserable. Yeah, so at seven and a half, you know, I I think they're a team that on paper is a lot better than a, a seven and a half win I, total. I agree. But I mean, they're I agree. Big, right. And look, they've got two terrible spots. They play at Ole Miss when they're coming off of playing Texas and then hosting South Carolina, and they go at Ole Miss where Ole Miss has got two weeks to prepare. And then two weeks later, they go at Missouri, and Missouri's got two weeks to prepare, and they're playing their fifth game in five weeks. So two of their toughest games on the road are – are are not ideal situ or ideal spots for the opponent that's at home. So I think they lose those two. I I think they probably lose to Texas, but you never know with that game. Um, Texas needs some running you know, backs. Yeah. Yes, they do. They are down to three scholarship yeah. running backs. One of them an incoming freshman, and one a true sophomore didn't play much last year. Um, now Tennessee at home and at Auburn. I mean, I doubt they sweep those. I mean, do they split those? They're minus three and a half to Tennessee at, at last look at games of the year. I think they're better than Auburn, but I mean, Jordan Hare, I mean, who knows? So, I mean, and then Alabama at home, they are in an ideal or a, a advantageous situation there is they get two weeks to prepare and Alabama is a look ahead to Auburn and then they are at LSU. So, man, I, I think they're a seven and five or eight and four team. Mm. And, you know, I haven't seen much of Jackson Arnold. I know he didn't play that great in the bowl game. So I'm just kind of wait and see with these guys. Oh, and one injury, uh, Jaden Gibson's out for the year. Their receiver, he only had 14 catches last year, but for 375 yards and five touchdowns. It's interesting with them. They could be a better team than a year ago with a worse record. Yes, much worse record. Yeah. Mm. Uh, B, let's go to Oklahoma's former conference, a team that I think uh, a lot of people around here like in Kansas State, that is, I believe, nine and a half. Last I saw it on on uh, on their win total. H how do you break down Kansas State's schedule? Yeah, so I wrote I, I don't know if I wrote this down two weeks ago or six weeks ago, but I have FanDuel nine and a half under yes, minus one forty four over plus one eighteen, and I've got them plus four hundred to win the big twelve. So I've marked them eight and one with three swing games. So they've got eight starters back on defense, only four on offense, but uh, DJ Giddens, stud running back, 1,226 yards last year, 5.5 yards per carry average. Avery Johnson, this guy is an absolute stud. 
can he stay healthy though? Um, I did like how they went and got a starter or a you know a guy with starting experience, uh, Taquan Roberson from UConn. Um, had the season-ending injury uh, a couple years ago, early in the year, but has 10 career starts, and he's a mobile guy, uh, kind of like um, Avery Johnson. And um, I think Johnson stays healthy. He has a monster season. So anyway, 8-1 and one with three swing games. So I've got them uh, losing at Iowa State, which is a winnable game. Um, I've got their three swing games being at Tulane, where I, I think they probably win. Um, and I've got the at Colorado, a swing game where they'll be favored. I want to say they're like six uh, in games of the year there. And then the other swing game I've got at West Virginia. Um, but I mean, there's other losables. I've got them winning. I mean, I've got them beating Kansas at home. They'll be favored there, but Kansas is dangerous and I've got them beating Oklahoma state at home that, you know, that'll be a tough one. And, and Arizona at home could be tough. They're minus eight at FanDuel. Uh, in that one. So uh, I'm going to say that, well, I'm going to say it's a pass because I, I would say over if I was confident Avery Johnson would be healthy for 12 games, but the way he runs the ball, it's hard to be confident in that, right? Uh, if I knew who was going to win that quarterback job at Tulane, I might, that, that's a tricky one in week two because yeah. that's, that's on yeah. the road. Like I wouldn't be excited for that. Yeah, I mean, Ole Miss went there last year and w- trailed for three quarters and then turned it on in the fourth quarter and got a couple of turnovers that made it. Uh, they actually covered that game, um, but that was a very misleading final. All right, let's go to I, – I get. I don't even know if you can even call them a dark horse because I, I feel like they have enough people's attention now, but let's go to old Southern Methodist University and SMU and that uh, – that that Metroplex area, man, they, they got a great break on the schedule from the ACC it's, office. Man. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> yes, I mean, I've got them at, mean, eight, and I, got at eight and a half. B. I like the over here, guys. Um, yeah. And yeah. FanDuel was eight and a half uh, plus one hundred four to the over. But again, I might have wrote that down two weeks ago or six weeks ago. I'm not sure. Um, so, I mean. <laughs> At Florida, I mean, I'm sorry, Florida State at home. I, I think that's a that's a tough one for FSU. Uh, I want to say they're favored by nine in games of the year, um, but I mean that uh, FSU wants to get on the airplane with a one point win and get their butts back to Tallahassee in that one. <laughs> so I've got them uh, ten and one with one swing game. I've got them losing at Louisville because it's after the FSU game, and uh, I got FSU being a swing game. I mean, look at all the other games. I mean, obviously they could lose to TCU at home potentially, but um, but I've got them winning that one. I mean, look at their road games. I mean, besides Louisville, at Nevada, at Stanford, at Duke, at UVA. I mean, those might be the three worst teams in the ACC in Stanford, Duke, and UVA. <laughs> those are their I, road games. And and on top of that, be I actually think they have good talent too. So not only oh, is yeah. the, not only is the schedule favorable, yeah. That's a good football team. Oh man, Phil Steele's national unit rankings are so high on them. Number nine at QB, number fifteen at running back, number eight wide receiver, eighteen O line, twenty five D line, number ten linebacker, nineteen in the secondary. Are, are we? How much time do we have? Oh, you got time. We got two minutes. Oh, let, oh ninety minutes. seconds. Okay, Preston Stone, twenty eight to six TDINT ratio last year. All of his wide receivers back. Their top four rushers back. Their top one, two, three, four, five. Top seven tacklers back. Granted, a G5 conference, but only gave up 17.8 points per game last year. Okay, their O-line, they lost three starters, but both starters they got back. First team all AAC last year, and they got four power four transfers on the O-line that have combined for 120 career starts. Mm -hmm. On the D-line, they got two transfers from Miami. One of them, 22 starts in his career for the Canes. The other, 20 career starts for the Canes. Their kicker, first team all AAC last year. I mean, they got a ball club. Uh, and, I like the and, over. And, and quietly, their NIL game is in full effect too. Oh yeah, they got they got plenty oh, yeah. of extra scratch laying around that place. Well, yeah, they started practicing yep. NIL early, so they're they're used to it. They're ready to go. <laughs> Decades ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not forget Rhett Lashley is uh, secretly a really good ball coach. <laughs> Thanks, hey, Mike. Might be the next coach at Arkansas. 
Yeah, that's the rumor, isn't it? Ooh-wee. Oh, wait, no, it's Big Suey. My bad. <laughs> a lot of pressure uh, on old Sam I am. B, we appreciate the time as always. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, fellas. Have a great weekend. Thanks, B. We'll be back with Michael Brunts, Husker 24-7, coming up next. Kicking off hour number three here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, KFOR, and Lincoln. That's DB. I'm Ravi Lula here on the Pillar Exterior Stage. We are joined now by Michael Brunts of Husker 24-7. What's up, Brunts? How's it going? Pretty good. How about you? Not not bad. Not bad. Fair, I'm, I'm fair, just trying to process fair, right fair, now. Fair, fair to Midland would be like a, a, a Brunts answer. Fair to Midland. I don't even know what that means, but I hear people say that, though. I think that's like an old people. Like I think my mom used to say that. Fair to Midland? Yeah. Bronx? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Robbie and I are having this conversation on and off air about how to assess teams. Be honest now. Not a leading question. When you look back at teams' records, how often do you think about when – and at what point of the season they played the game? Um, when I look back, yeah, like I, season's like, over, yeah. Nebraska's eight like, and four. Like for instance, like when you looked at Colorado last year, and then you're like, oh man, they gave Nebraska a loss. Do you look at when they played Nebraska? Well, that's a great question. Yeah, I think a little bit. I Do mean, you? Have to. Okay. So oh, I just wondered how natural it is for you. Um, I, I think it's a, I think it's a data point. I mean, I think it's, I think you look probably more whenever you like in your Colorado example, where a team comes out and blows the doors off of TCU in the opener looks okay against Nebraska in, uh, in, in week two. And then just, you know, struggled the rest of the way down the line. I mean, I, I think you you do kind of have to, you know, look at the time and when that when that happened. I mean, I I always kind of look. I don't I don't think I'm a huge future schedule guy, but I I, I note things like Nebraska having back to back road games against um, Ohio State and Indiana, and just when those games fall and. There's a few teams probably that whenever you see them on the schedule, though, you're like, okay, you know, there's a chance that, you know, a team might be a little bit more beat up after playing this team. I mean, Michigan used to kind of be that way, I think, where you kind of knew you were in for a little bit of a physical game and you don't know what you're going to be coming out of that. But I, I think I think the Colorado example, you, you definitely have to consider kind of when they played that game because I, I don't know how much Colorado you guys watched. Um, uh, well, unfortunately, they were on national television quite a bit, so it's like I watched. <laughs> I, oh, I, a choice. I, I watched a ton. I remember I was coming back from one Nebraska broadcast, and I think they were playing Colorado State at night, and I was like, "Which was a phenomenal game." I'm like, why is this way. game yeah. on? Yeah, it was like multiple overtimes. I remember I had it on in my dash, playing it through the Bluetooth, and I was just like, "How much more of this are we going to have to put up with?" <laughs> yeah. No. Well, then you got you got Colorado Stanford in prime time, and that's. Uh, that didn't look good for Colorado. Which also either. turned out to Low be like a phenomenal you know, game. Like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they played they played some bangers last year. Um, not a lot of them went their way, but uh, yeah, I, I think you consider it. Like I, I I think you do consider that. Um I don't know. I, I it's just weird. I look at Nebraska skit like so. The yeah, the reason this whole thing came up, I look at like them the team that lost to Minnesota versus who was trotting out there on offense by the time they played Maryland. Do you know what I mean? But it's like, I don't love to do that when it comes down to bottom line because everybody has things that happen throughout the course right. of the season. Yeah. But there is, a, there is a story to tell within that, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I was even thinking more just about opponents by that point. I mean, like, because, I mean, by the time you get late in the season – I mean, it is a test of depth, right? Like you're not going to, you're not going to have all your, your, your guys that were starting for you in August by that point. I mean, that's just how the sport works. And so I I don't know. I mean, I think you do have to consider, I think you have to consider the time of year that a game happens, but I don't know that that can be an excuse for how the game turns out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just a data point. Yeah. Brunts, do you think you think more about what's happening with Nebraska or the team you're covering or rooting for or whatever 
than you do about the opponent. Because I think that's what I look at more. It's like, okay, that was the first game that Heinrich Harburg started. Or, you know, if Colorado's case is like, ah, well, they lost Travis Hunter in that game. So then I like, I think I view it from a more myopic point of view and less about the opponent and more about what's happening internally, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, this past year, I mean, you know, I, the, the game after Nebraska loses two of its top running backs, I mean, is not it's going to look markedly different. I mean, I, I think that's something that you you kind of have to consider. And I understand it's like a bottom line thing, but there's, there's, that there's sounds things more like that. that. There's things within that that affect the bottom line. You know, when you guys are describing this in my head, I'm like, OK, what do I do? I think one is more fan geared. One is more like analytically geared. Like how a fan would maybe look at it versus yeah. I, I want to get in the nuts and bolts of this deal. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, I it, maybe maybe one's more a little bit more of an emotional thing versus actually digging into it. I mean, I, I think I also I say this from like some of the teams that I root for. I, sometimes I just don't want to hear it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. Like, it's, yeah. It's like, if I sit down and watch three hours of Oakland A's baseball, like I, I, I don't care that, you know, this, like I, I want to see a win. So mm. I, I, can, I can understand that. That's very interesting how you would think the fan perspective may be a little more excuse prone, but I actually think it's kind of tougher. It is. You're, I mean, you're, you're, you're less, you know what I mean? I think it's tougher when you haven't had success. Like when you're a yeah. team like Nebraska or unfortunately mm-hmm. like your Oakland A's, like, and you haven't experienced a ton of success, you're tired of the excuse. Yeah. Right? You're, you, you, yeah. you're less forgiving of the Broncos. Whereas if Bronx, you've been good, then I would be, if you've been good, yeah. you want to go back and get it and be like, ah, well, our starting, our starting guard was hurt and yeah. our quarterback was coming off of a rolled ankle and he played, but he wasn't healthy and. Like you start to, you know, if you're 11 and one, you want to explain the one, right? Yeah. Whereas right. if you're five and seven, you're like, hey, go and win any other game of the season, and we would have been cool. Yeah. No. I mean, it. I, I think. I think when you're talking seven years from a bowl game, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know that some people are willing to entertain the nuance. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it, yeah. at some point, you just make the make the damn play. I mean, that's. <laughs> That's kind of where we're, where, where I think a lot of people are at is like, you know, with, with, if you're in the red zone with the chance to go in and win the game, win the game, like, Speak. you know, regardless of who it is throwing a pass that's, you know, late and, and inaccurate, like, you know, I, I think that's, that kind of colors the discussion around Nebraska football right now is, you know, it would be one thing if it were like, you know, you, you basically hadn't wandered through the wilderness for almost a decade, but, um, you know, I, I think when when you kind of are in that kind of a context, it tends to uh, it tends to eliminate some of the patience there. Brunson, and the same same similar vein, and you're you're pretty rational. So why have we kind of? Why do you think it is that like Bryce Benhart can get better, but we we come off as though Turner Corcoran cannot? That's a good question. Um, I'm dead serious. I don't know. No, I know. I, I it is a good question. I mean, I I, I think that's uh, that that's the big one for the offensive line is uh, it, is and then uh, there was actually a thread on our board about it this week about whether or not <laughs> you know, he's kind of poised, <laughs> kind of poised to make that wh- whether he could be the you know Ben Hart two point oh like mm-hmm. and he I mean he's not alone. I mean, there's other guys that yep. have been around the program for a long time and yep. you're kind of wondering if they could do the same thing. Um, we almost left Tommy Hill for dead, didn't we? You did. We did. Um, at least, at least uh, Turner's sticking in one position. I guess that's the one thing to say. But, <laughs> well, it's uh, just it's just weird because I remember, and the thing that I bristle up, I remember what was said about Ramirez Johnson after Maryland. Oh, any guy's too small, or he can't do this, or he needs a hole, or and then it's like, well, then he gets hurt. Oh, he's just injury prone. Like maybe he comes back, maybe he doesn't. Now that he's back, it's like, ooh, go Ramirez. It's like it's just. It's just we pick and choose when we want to be optimistic about development and best case results, even though there's track, there's like proven track records all over the place. There is, there are, I mean, there's, there's some for the other way too. Um, you know, I, I, and I, I think, 
I, I think that, uh, you know, in college football now too, uh, I, I think it's hard to, you know, even if Matt Rule stands up there and says, you know, we're a developmental program, you know, we're, some guys are going to take a couple of years and, you know, this is like, I, I, there's just not, there's not the built in patience, you know, like mm-hmm. I, it, it's very much a, uh, a win now type thing. And, and, you know, guys developing quickly. I mean, I, I, guys being written off early in their careers are, are not, I mean, I, I understand that Corcoran is older, but you know, guys being written off and, and kind of feeling like you have the book on somebody. I mean, that, that's not a new, a new phenomenon, you know? Yeah, Bruns, I, I guess, could, could I make the argument to you that, and I, I understand there's examples of it going the other way too, where guys just don't get better or it doesn't work out, but I guess specifically on the offensive line, mm-hmm. uh, and I know it's a small sample size over two years with Rayola, but the vast majority of the evidence would tell you that it's the players get better, right? Like, I mean, we don't have a, at least that I can think of, and cor- please correct me if I'm wrong, like, do we have a lot of examples of in that specific group with Rayola, things sliding backwards for guys? Because I don't really recall it if we do. No, I don't, I don't think guys sliding backwards. I, I think they have done a pretty nice job. Uh, certainly Ben Hart. I think Justin Evans, you could probably put in that, that category as well um, for the way they've kind of developed him. Um, I think you put Newelli in that yeah. category last year. I thought he got a lot better. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think that's, I think it's like, it's not specific to this coaching staff. I mean, I think, I think when I'm speaking from strictly like, a, you know, what I read from fans, mm-hmm. it's, it's more like guys kind of just plateau. You know what I mean? Like a, a guy's been in the program for three years. Um, you, you don't kind of see the market progress. I mean, even like Ben Hart, I mean, that was year, year five for him where things took off. Um, I mean, I, I think there's definitely the potential for guys to do that. I mean, a, another case hmm. in that group too, um, Henry Lutovsky is kind of in that, that group too, I think where it's, you know, guys been around for a while. I haven't played a ton, but I mean, can, can he kind of make that next jump? So um, no, I mean, I, I, that group in particular, I, I think guys have stayed pretty steady and, and gotten better. Um, but I, I'm just, from what I'm re- what I read, um, you know, it's, it's a lot of <laughs> wait and see. So, I, so I guess my question would be: from what you read, it it seems like they're unable to separate the last two years from the longer term problems. Is that a fair assessment? Uh, I I think the pain is just kind of all rolled into one. Okay. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Okay, that makes sense. Bronce, have you allowed yourself, or do you think about? we always talk about players getting better in their development. How about the staff kind of year two together situationally now that 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 offense has a little bit better identity and the defense has now had a chance to make adjustments in year two. Well, the the staff will be better in game because they share some of that responsibility too. Yeah, they do. I mean, it's, if you kind of go back and look at, the way that November played out last year, there were some spots where it was a little iffy, um, I think. And I think, I think part of it is, you know, that they have another year of kind of understanding their personnel um, and and who can help you and who can't. I mean, part of it too, was you got to the end of last season and it was kind of like, okay, who are we putting in here right now? Like what, what, (laughs) Hey, what, what, who's in this personnel package? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's like what what freshman are we trotting out there um, in, in a key moment? No, I, I I think I think there's definitely something to be said for that. I you know Tony White or Matt Rule said something about the defense that kind of piqued my interest, but I, it, it feels like we're maybe not defensively talking enough about like what what does year two look like for this group in terms of how how kind of more advanced Nebraska can get. Because, you know, Matt, I think it was Matt Rule said, you know, we're doing a lot of things differently defensively this year based on the personnel that we have. And I was kind of intrigued by that because, you know, it, it does feel like you're kind of moving on to like the 200 and 300 level type stuff that you can do with that defense. And, you know, I, I think 
probably, especially on the defensive side of the ball, I mean, for a guy like Rob Dvorak having his second year in this defense, I, I guess he could probably coach it and teach it a heck of a lot better than he could this time last year. I'm guessing Terrence Knight is the same way. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the coaching piece of it, the in-game decision part of it, that all kind of plays together. And, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're hammering the chasing three message. It's, uh, you know, some of those decisions are part of that as well. And, 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 you know, you look at five, six plays during the course of a game, um, you know, a decision here or there can really kind of shift the balance. So I, I agree that that's, that's part of it. And, uh, you know, I, I would hope that they're better off for kind of having gone through last year and, and kind of where they're at as coaches now. Yeah, I asked Gifford um, at Big Ten Media Days because I want to know specifically. I'm like, I keep hearing, you know, you guys are, hey, we got to get better. We, you guys haven't done anything yet. And I said, yeah, the conferences have film on your defense, but you're also year two. And you get to make adjustments and tweaks. And he sat up in his seat, didn't he? And he goes, Ravi, he goes, yeah, exactly. Like, we get to build on what we did last year. And mm-hmm. we now know where we weren't very good mm-hmm. and where we were vulnerable. And I'm like, it, it's so understated. Like, there's things I can do with Christian Jones in year this year that I, mm-hmm. I wouldn't have done last year. Like, it just, like, those kinds of things matter. You can have tape. But we got a marker and dry erase board too, like at Nebraska. Yeah. No, I, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, for, from being around the practice in very limited, limited uh, doses, I, I, I don't think that there's anything in the way that Tony White coaches during a practice that would suggest to me that they're resting on what they did last year. Like that's just not, yeah. n- not part of the way he operates. And, I don't know. I mean, when you have a guy like John Butler come in and say, yeah, this defense is really pretty unique, like, and you, you kind of layer that on top of what they said about, you know, what they're doing differently this year. I, I'm kind of curious to see what that looks like. Cause I, I think that, that that's, that's the next step. And I mean, you can get into like the third down defense and turnovers, which are a big piece of that, but I, I don't, uh, I don't think it's going to be the same type of group and, and scheme that's going to be trotted out that first week against UTEP. I mean, I'm expecting to see some different wrinkles there. Yeah, and they slid a couple of things in low key, right? Uh, early on and before the season started in the first presser, it's like, Hey, what's one of the areas you want to get better at? And Tony White was like, Hey, I want to match our secondary up on receivers better. We got caught in some bad matchups last year. Mm-hmm. Like that kind of falls on deaf ears, but Hey, you may not want, you know, Gifford on a number two in the slot to an open side or whatever it is. Right. I just, whatever, but right. Yeah. Like if the more you can cross train, like the better situationally you can be within your scheme. That's yeah. like, that's pretty scary if you can do that. Well, I, I mean, uh, we've talked about it, but I mean, having Javin Wright on the field for three downs, I mean, that, that changes. Right. Guess. Yeah. You, yeah. You get a tight end and he's flexed out and you got to get underneath three. Like you trust Wright can get there. He's used to covering. Yeah. So, I mean, I think bigger roles for guys like that that are a little bit more versatile, um, that, that's, that's maybe where the magic is there, right? Like you can do different things that you maybe couldn't do last year. Brunson seems like a place that uh, at least the Big Ten Network thought there might have been some magic was in the defensive front. The, both uh, Griffith and Revson had some pretty glowing things to say. Were you surprised at all about kind of how effusive they seemed? I know you guys wrote up about it on – uh, on Husker 24 seven. Um, were you, did that take you by surprise at all? Or are you kind of on the same page as far as what you think that defensive front can be? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that's a pretty, pretty obvious one, um, you know, and, and a place that, that probably deserves focus. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, uh, it feels like if, if you kind of know about Nebraska's defensive line and you're outside of our bubble, it feels like you've like, found like this really good restaurant that not many people know about. <laughs> and it, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you've got, I mean, this isn't hyperbole. I mean, I think you've got a legit three deep of guys that you'd probably trust on that defensive line. And then you kind of have the more situational guys like James Williams. I think Kai Wallen's probably a little bit more in that, that group as well. But yeah, th- there's a lot of guys you can move around. Um, 
I mean, Ty Robinson looks like he's, you know, a, an adult playing against little kids out there. I mean, that that's how big he looks. And, you know, what, what's the step next step for Nash? I mean, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of right, rightful intrigue about that group and what it can be. Um, Cause I, I think they've done a really nice job of building depth there. And certainly, uh, you know, getting getting Nash and tie back. I mean, that that just completely changes the look of your defense. Uh, let me ask you something, Brad. See if if you had your druthers and you want you put your fan hat on for a second, and you want Nebraska to have the type of success that uh, the rest of the fan base does. Who are we talking about more at the end of the season, Rob Dvorak's development or the addition of Glenn Thomas? I think Thomas. I'll go. I'll go Thomas because I think I think having somebody whose only job is to just deal with quarterbacks. I think there's a lot of value in that, mm. and I think it allows Marcus Satterfield to kind of be an offensive coordinator a little bit more. I think I think if if you have the kind of success that fans are wanting. I think a lot of it is going to be because of improved quarterback play. I mean, I, I, I it, it just has to be better. And, you know, I, I think, I think a lot of it is going to be due to that coaching. And, you know, the, the thing too, I mean, when you're, you're talking about a group that has, you know, two of the three guys and, you know, scholarship guys in that room or freshmen, you kind of have to manage that a little bit differently too. And, and kind of how you bring guys along, what you talk about, that, that kind of thing. So I, I, I think it would be more towards his work, but I, I mean, that's not to discount the job that, that Dvorak has in front of him where you, you basically have what three guys that, that you feel probably good about right now. And you have to bring along a couple more. So, I mean, he, he's got a, he's got his work cut out too, but I think, I think the Glenn Thomas piece of it is, is uh, you know, I think would be more impactful just because of how many areas the, the quarterback play touches. Man, I, I, I just hope, I think selfishly, mm-hmm. that Dvorak gets his flowers after this year because I, I, I think he's pretty spectacular. I want those yeah, guys I mean, to – I want those guys to really – like, I think they have the best case study for development. Mm. You know, like if you're starting with your lab experiment, like I think he has the best test subjects where you can say, yep, yep that guy is a million, that guy is, was worth his salt. I mean, he did last year too, right? I mean, you, you had Makai Bayer come out of nowhere early in the season and he's playing Jack and he's got, you know, he's, he's playing middle linebacker too. Um, and I don't know. I mean, are we talking enough too about kind of how you have to fill that void left by – Henrich and and uh, Reimer, just from a leadership point of view. I mean, they, I mean maybe, but I, I don't get the sense that we really appreciated their play. Mm, probably not. Do you know what I mean? As, like as a, like if, if you're looking for a reverent standpoint, I don't know if we thought that much of them. I, I don't know. You know what I mean? Reimer maybe more than yeah. Henrich. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. fair. That's our guy, Michael Brunts, Husker 24-7. Great stuff as always, Brunts. We'll talk to you again next week. Sounds good. See you. Thanks, Brunzi. Coming up next, we've got more Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, Capital R in Lincoln. We're back here on Herd Out Sports Radio, AM 590, ESPN Omaha, ESPN Tri-Cities, Capital R in Lincoln, and reminding you to get out to Lordson Gardens for their garden games. Through September 2nd, they've got all sorts of stuff. If you want to check out the videos, DB and I went out there. DB got dominated in badminton. It was why embarrassing you, why for him. Why are you fibbing to that? Um, you know, you would think his general athleticism would translate. It didn't. Dude, the one that you hit <laughs> over my head, it's the first time I touched a racket and a birdie in 30 years. <laughs> and what happened the very next time? Oh, I, it's almost like I got a feel for it. I don't recall. No. Uh, all I know is that you got to get out to lordsandgardens.org to get tickets. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know that they have the video playing on a loop anywhere of me of me just dominating DB yep. in badminton. But I, I know one thing: <laughs> after you, say, after, I, I seen after you saw my footwork and run around on that forehand, you're like, "Oh yeah, this dude's serious." That was good. That was nice. It was good footwork <laughs> moving around on the forehand. Yeah. Uh, get out to LawrenceandGardens.org for tickets. I, it was a fun time out I, there, though. We had a full slate 
yesterday. We went in the afternoon for however long. It seemed like 18 hours. And there were people still trying to play tennis before the rain started. Oh, yeah. And it was some older folks. And I'm like, you know how hard this sport would be? I mean, they were fantastic. Mm -hmm. And they had to be in their 50s. Oh, yeah. 60s. And I'm like, I'm not returning any of those. And I'm okay. Like, just to watch these serves, I'm like, this I don't even. I, I, I think people, I need a better appreciation for tennis because tennis I'm, is really hard. I'm watching these guys just return balls at like you know 130 mile an hour serves, like no big deal. Yeah, you know how fast 130 mile an hour is? Really fast. You have like no reaction time. Yeah, <laughs> yesterday no I'm deal. probably watching 70, 75, and I'm like, mm, it's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I don't think people like you wouldn't even see it if you're if you've got somebody if you've got like Ben Shelton out there going like 145 mm. on you, you're not even seeing that. Yeah, no. You wouldn't know it hit you until you fell down. I just, I would think of the, uh, was that Mr. Deeds where they were playing tennis on the court and he kept hitting the ball? Yeah, out? he's like, hey, if I just hit you, but does I was, that count? I in? could just imagine if you had guys serving, they served at you. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, just, I would just be getting out of the way. They do that sometimes because it forces you to make a decision with your body about how you want to hit the ball. Yeah, I'm not very reflexy anymore. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> dunk, <laughs> dunk. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. Just, just taking them like happy Gilmore in like, the batting cage. You know how you have those little suction cups, marks from treatment yeah. and stuff. No. Hey, what'd no, you get? What'd you get worked tennis. on? No, no, it's, <laughs> it's tennis. That's what that was. Man, I see people. I know people. That's what, I think that's why that's why pickleball got popular because it's, it's not near, it's not it's yeah. not near the speed and it's very similar in terms of movements. There's some there's some carryover. It's also it's like. It's much less technical, so there's a lower like barrier of entry to learning it. Isn't the court smaller too? It is. Yeah, yeah, significantly. So it's a little bit easier to navigate if you're not quite in shape yet. But Did you watch ping pong in the Olympics? Oh yeah, those guys are crazy. That was ludicrous. Yeah, those are insane. I like ping pong a lot, actually. I know two very very good ping pong players. Yeah, Bud Crawford, Tom Thompson. Bud Crawford makes sense. Hand yeah. speed, coordination. Yeah. And Tom is like six twelve, so his wingspan is about yeah, it gets 94, everything ninety four. Oh dang. Yeah, and I would and imagine, he use, and he could use both hands. I would imagine Bud would be brutal to play against. Yeah, he's highly competitive too. Yeah, which yeah, we I've seen him at summer league. <laughs> yeah, right. He used to get after him. Oh, yeah. I know. It was a lot of fun. I know. He would come. I would always. I'd like it when his fights were scheduled in a way that he'd be able to come out. Yeah. Like I liked it when he fought like in April, May, so that he'd come out and play whole all of summer league rather than he was fighting like July, August, and he'd be out in training camp somewhere. Yeah. Watch him hit a softball about three hundred fifteen feet too. Yeah, he might just be a good athlete. <laughs> The great ones do. They're not satisfied. You know, it's uh, that's that's on the table. I think that Bud Crawford is good athlete. Is that on the table? <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Man, I'm gonna give this some thought. <laughs> I don't know. If that, I don't think that's a hot take. I think he's a pretty good athlete. <laughs> hot take. Kind kind of like the, the Viking he, season's over without McCarthy. I know he's not hot take. Super tall, but can you imagine that guy playing corner? Bud. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like I feel like he would just lock people up. Yeah. He's a rail too. You're not trying to get like, not anymore, man. He's going 154 hold full time. Man, hopefully they get Ortiz, maybe or somebody. I don't know. We'll see what the next fight looks like. I'm just saying, can you imagine him in like bump and run? He got that little punch on you. Like, good luck, bud. Yeah, <laughs> he's his reflexes are oh obviously, insane, obviously incredible. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it. Unbelievable. It's it's hard to believe that like me and him are the same species. You know what else is hard <laughs> yeah, to believe? Right. <laughs> How are the Steelers on get up again? Because <laughs> they. Got done talking about J.J. McCarthy. <laughs> so if you were going to be in sports media right now. I wouldn't be talking about the Steelers. No, but time out, though. Yeah. There's probably only three things you need to know. Okay. Right? Steelers. Quarterback battle. The Jets. Aaron Rodgers. And what else is always on? We're just talking. There's a lot of Ayuk stuff every day. It's it's. And if you really want to be fancy, yeah. somehow weave in LeBron and the Lakers. <laughs> Oh, CD. We get CD every day. It's like, yeah, CD Liam's contract. Oh, are we still doing this? Yeah. Listen, it's the uh, how about that calling his shot C- or Parsons calling his shot. CD will be in camp. <laughs> does CD know that? <laughs> well, we kind of like Jerry Rice tweeting out and be like, "Hey, does, does Brandon know he's coming back?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, Jerry Rice may not be that nice of a guy sometimes. <laughs> I mean, listen, we got all the old guys. Emmett is speaking on when you're the goat, you the Dal- it. Dallas and stuff. You got Jay Rice speaking on San Fran. When you got the uh, when they going to ask Greg Lloyd about what's going on in Pittsburgh. Ain't nobody asking Greg Lloyd. 
Not if you don't want to answer. <laughs> I know that. I feel like James Harrison's more of a spokesperson so, type. I, full disclosure, yeah. I'm probably going to take Lloyd though, and I know Harrison is a is preference a, is a, or ju- or ability. Ability. Uh, he's like a he's like a sixth or seventh degree black belt. Okay. Yeah. Greg Lloyd. That's aggressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not but trying to, lo- I try to test yeah, that. I, but I take you know anytime Harrison wants to go on a dark alley. Yeah, I'll, I'll take him with me. I'll take him in my corner for sure. I was tweeting out a couple of pictures last week or the week before he was at Steelers camp, just wearing a black T-shirt and shorts, mean mugging everybody. Yep, walking around with a bad attitude. Yep. <laughs> T.J. Watt was like, "Man, I I heart him." <laughs> he seems like a football player's football player. Yeah, like that's the vibe I get of James Harrison. How many times they cut him before he was a star? Uh, several. Tw- yeah, he didn't do anything until he was like twenty-eight. Yeah. In terms of sticking, funny thing is, is when I, you're looking, and they at, played until he was like forty. Like the organization, like I, I say it tongue in cheek, but I don't know why they're on every day. Yeah, every day there's something on about the Steelers, and most people don't. I listened to two guys yesterday afternoon, and it was the the team. You know, the team that both guys picked to win a division, mm-hmm. the Bengals. Yeah, we've. Uh, yeah, did you, did a, you see but, Nick Wright? Dude, Burrow on the Pivot podcast yeah. was incredible. Really? He, I'm a big Burrow guy. He's, you know this. He's kind of neurotic. Yeah, he is. Way way more so than you would think for how. Right, because he comes across like as just fun, cool. lovey. Lo- man. Yeah. No, he is. He's got his style, and it is. In, he is full on. Yeah. Peter, get off the pot. Yeah. He is. It, you know, it's kind of, I think. You know, I, I mentioned we do this with coaches sometimes in terms of, like, how a guy looks depends on how we judge them a little bit. I feel like we do that with quarterbacks, too, a little bit, where, like, Tom Brady, you don't expect somebody that's, like, good-looking like Tom Brady. You kind of assume that maybe everything came easy to him, they came more naturally. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, no, Tom Brady's a full-on psycho about football and prep and stuff like that. Where you see Peyton Manning, where he sort of looks like a dork, and you're like, yeah, that guy's in the film room a lot. You're like, hey, Burrow, why'd you dye your hair? I was bored. Switch it up. Need something different to do. Yeah. Different look for myself. Like, now he's going full Slim Shady on us. Money. He's telling a story about how nobody can visit him on Saturdays. His parents come in town sometimes to see him. He's like, no. <laughs> Turn around. Go back not, to the hotel. Not, not on Saturdays. Like, this is non negotiable. Yeah. Like, he just, he just, but you watch him and you listen to him, like, when he's mic'd up and stuff. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, I, I rally with this dude. Oh yeah, like he he definitely puts the the requisite work in and a little bit more. I still think he has pressure. I do too. And I love like I love him, but I think he's getting a pass. I think so cuz he hasn't been bad, he's just been hurt. Yeah. We're more willing to forgive the things we didn't see than the things we did see. Right? Like if you see something bad, that's hard to forget. Mm-hmm. When you just don't see anything new, it's easy to remember the good stuff, right? Like that's kind of human nature. Bad stuff sticks in our like, bad stuff sticks in our mind, pretty aggressively. Who's got the tougher head coach quarterback situation, Sirianni or Sala? Ooh, uh, well, I want to say Sala because I think Aaron Rodgers is harder to deal with, but I know there's issues between Sirianni and Hurts. Mm. If I didn't know about pre-existing issues, I'd say Sala and Rodgers because I think Rodgers is a nightmare to deal with. That's the vibe that I get. You know who kind of gets a pass? Who? It's always the Jets, isn't it? <laughs> Not the pass. It seems like Shanahan kind of gets a pass. Kyle? Yeah. For what? For it's, blowing stuff? Yeah. We, yeah. He, so, it, 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 it don't, like, it doesn't stick. It's crazy. Like, people bring it up, but it doesn't stick. Yeah, yeah. I think there's just a, uh, I think there's a respect for him that people it's are. what it, yeah what he is yeah that's just like eh, you know he'll, he'll get it eventually i think he's young enough too people assume he'll go get one uh that's db i'm robbie little we'll wrap up the show coming next wrapping up the show today here on herd out sports radio am 590 espn all my espn tri cities kfr and lincoln that's db i'm robbie lula here on the pillar exterior stage at herd out sports bar and grill kind of a weird exchange happening on twitter with uh amazing daniel and db they're both espousing their love for Miami Dolphin great Joey Porter. It's strange. It's not, I don't know. I Miami, don't know why you're doing that. Yeah, Miami Dolphin great. It's weird. Well, that would he's one of those guys. You asked a you long really time like ago. The Cardinals. 
<laughs> where you have like an irrational blind spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's one yeah, of yours. Yes. Yeah. I, I got that. I mean that. I don't know. Just that linebacking core, and the only guy I was probably out on was may have may have been the most consistent of the bunch, and that was uh, Levon Kirkland. Mm, yeah. But I just didn't. I couldn't get over the body type. I love him because he was. You know, a stealer. It was a stealer. Yeah, isn't that the one everybody liked though? Levon Kirkland. Yeah, I mean maybe. You know who I was irrationally a big fan of? Chad Brown. Uh, no, two guys. Seattle Seahawks. Chad Brown. <laughs> I mean, according to you, Oakland Raider Jerry Rice. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Denver Bronco Jerry Rice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I really loved Merton Hanks. But uh, you know what's interesting though? Yeah. And I get it because of the Super Bowl. You see a lot of Peyton Manning stuff in Denver. Yeah. 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 You know, and it's, and it's funny because the Super Bowl he actually won. Like he was bad that year, <laughs> like really bad. I just it, like Brock Osweiler was a better option. It was just that's how bad Peyton. Manning. Are you just, talking like gear or like yes, signage? Yes. So it, like you, in articles and stuff. It's like, yeah. Is there Elway gear beside it? Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there. Wow. I was a big, I was a big Merton Hanks guy. You know, this is, I don't even know if I should say this, but you, you could have convinced me that Elway was overrated. Oh, I, I could buy that. If, I, could, I could buy that. I, I know like my Sam and some of these guys, they'll, they'll kill me for that. Historically, but. he's not going to stand up the way, like you're going to have to explain a lot if you're still. Playing. I go all the way back to Stanford. Oh, okay. You're right. Like the, all the, way the folklore is just like. Because they weren't very good at Stanford either. All right, right. Didn't win. Like, they didn't win at Stanford. <laughs> they were very good. But, you know, I get the whole that's Yankees the funny thing. thing about, and... That's the funny thing about the uh, Stanford Cal game, the band game, right? It's like, that was a, that was not good teams. <laughs> <laughs> Look, so who would you be? I, I referenced two of them already. Who would you rather be going into this season? Okay. Ready? Yeah. Mike McCarthy. Okay. Sala. Mm-hmm. Or, or is that just those two? No. Okay. I'm drawing a blank. My second guy. I just said it earlier. Oh, Sirianni. Oh. Uh, my gut says McCarthy. See. But here, let me. You got to think about their situation. Right. Yeah. That's, and, okay. If I, I understand there's always drama in Dallas, right? But. For all intents and purposes, you think Jerry Jones is a good owner. I think he's mostly a good owner. I yeah. think he's going to end up paying CD. I, uh, I think he, you know, it, there's no open festering wounds between McCarthy and the quarterback. Like, for being Dallas, and this is a weird, like, I'm going to choose the situation with the least amount of drama. And weirdly enough, I think that's Dallas. Because that is normally not the thing you associate with Dallas is drama-free. Because there's always going to be the noise, right? But internally, I don't think it's a very dramatic locker room right now. So, and we're operating under the assumption that CeeDee Lamb signs, right? Yeah, that he gets paid. Yeah. I assume he's going to. I Gary ends up paying everything. Because you do realize if CeeDee Lamb, they're the most impacted, I think. If CeeDee Lamb doesn't get paid. If CeeDee Lamb doesn't play, Dallas isn't good. Yeah. He, he, yes, I am. I mean, that, that offense turns into TI, mediocre. Yeah, I in a hurry. I'm under the assumption that C.D. Lamb's going to get paid because Jerry pretty much pays everybody. Like that's just what he does. Um, and I am not under the assumption that things are just going to magically work out between Hertz and Sirianni. Right, but let me ask you something. Yeah, who has the better roster, the Jets or Dallas? Jets, probably. I you could make the case. It's the Jets. I think Jets have a good roster. I think they do. I. I'm less sold on Philly's roster so you than would, some you people would, are. So you would still rather be McCarthy? Yes, I would. I I am choosing the Just because the Jets have that cloud. Yeah, and it's also... They're, they're, the, they're the Jets? Well, for two things. A, the drama. Because, like, would I rather... Like, you know, for all the negativity we throw on Aaron Rodgers? Yeah. He sure does win a lot. <laughs> But when he plays, considering what when think, he plays, okay, yeah, he always wins. Considering what we believe his talent to be, can I make the argument that he should have won more? Listen, if he gets the, if the Jets win the division and they're the playoffs, mm-hmm. is it 
that did he overcome the fact that they're the Jets or is it not good enough because we expect Aaron Rodgers to win rings? I mean, I expect Aaron Rodgers to win, win, win rings. But it's pretty hard, though. It is. But guys of his caliber have multiple rings. Like throughout the history of the NFL, guys that we talk about the way we talk about Aaron Rodgers have multiple rings. That's almost a foolproof statement. That's how it goes. If you're going to be talked about the way we talk about Aaron Rodgers, you have multiple rings. Like that was that. I mean, I'm trying to think of anybody. I I don't know if I love that. I think it's true. Like, I I don't know. The guy that I thought of first, that's the most well-regarded that doesn't have multiple. The guy that came to my mind was Steve Young. Steve Young gets talked about with a lot of reverence, and I think rightfully so. We don't talk about Steve like we talk about. About Rodgers, though. Yeah. Not in that same category, but he's the closest one I could think of off the top of my head. I can't think of a guy. You might have been talking about him like that back in like 94, 95, though. But he certainly didn't have the longevity. Like he had a a peak that was really, really good. Like he had four or five years. That was probably in that neighborhood. But Rodgers has been doing this for 15 years. If uh, a little longer, actually, uh, r- right at 15, I think pretty close. Um, yeah, because he had to sit. Yeah, so he's had a couple. He came out in 05, yeah. so like 15, 16 years. But I I mean, if you can if you can come up with guys, I'm, I'm open to it. But the guys that we talk about, because we talk about Aaron Rodgers as an all timer. And the guys that we talk about in that way all have multiple rings, all of them. Yeah. There's going to be a lot of guys that, I don't know. I, I mean, Marino comes to mind with none. Yeah. But there are some guys. But that also defines Marino. But, he, so here's my pushback. There are guys that have multiple that I would put nowhere near an Aaron Rodgers category. That's 100% true. Your Eli Mannings of the world is the first one that pops up. I mean, Eli Manning's the, the most recent one with multiple rings that you wouldn't put anywhere near that category. Probably like Staubach. Um, I throw Bradshaw in there, not trying to be offensive, but oh, I just, well, yeah, that's... Um, you know, uh, I, there's more than you'd probably. Right. There are guys. So like it goes the other way, but generally, and here's the argument that I, I'd be open to is do we only talk about guys that way because they got multiple rings? Like if you wanted to reverse engineer it, and be like, do we talk them, them about that way as opposed to other guys? I don't know if I would say that either, because I think the only yeah, but guy that has multiple is Manning. Recently, yeah. Recently. Like in the last 30 years. Like the he's the one that can't shake. Well, hey, man, I want multiple. Yeah, it doesn't matter for him because we saw too much of the other stuff. I don't think there's another guy. I mean. Lamar could be headed down that path. Yeah. But it would be about another decade of being good. So you, I saw a stat the other day about when Lamar Jackson plays and when they don't, and it's twice the points. Yeah, it's, a, it's unreal. It's incredible. Yeah. But his playoff it's, success it's, is it, a huge hole in his it's, resume. It's right? incredible. It is. And the same thing with Aaron Rodgers. Like, your point's well taken. He wins a ton. But it's, there's massive holes in There's a massive hole in his resume. I don't know, man. I, I'm not here for the staunch Aaron Rodgers defense, but because I have said, given his talent, you'd think he'd have more than one. Yeah. But yeah, he needs some things to go right, too. I mean, I think they had pretty good situations in Great Bay for a lot of that tenure. I don't know, man. We don't love McCarthy. Right, but we've also made the argument that that's silly, too. No. Or that we should. No, no, we haven't, we haven't made that argument. We made, we made the, the argument, argument that, that Sean Payton gets more love then McCarthy, then McCarthy does, even though doesn't make a lot of sense. McCarthy is the better version of Fair. the two. Yeah, I do think McCarthy is the better version of the two. And maybe we don't love McCarthy, and that's fine. But I, I don't know. I, I think you're talking about a handful of guys in any given time in the league that were definitely better than McCarthy. Like, and, and at no point would I say that about Aaron Rodgers. That there were a handful of guys better than him. Mm-hmm. No, I wouldn't either. Hmm. I wouldn't either. I have to give that some. So that's thought. the other thing. I, I don't. I don't. Lo- I don't. I don't love. I can see you bristling I, up. Yeah, I don't. I don't like that. But really. I would need some data points. Well, I, I think you start with like number one. I I feel like we're saying two things, right? McCarthy gets doesn't get the love that he should, but it because Aaron Rodgers had him, they should have. He should have won more. 
I'm, I mean, I think McCarthy is better than people think about him as. I'm not saying he should have won more with McCarthy. I'm saying I don't think McCarthy was an active hindrance to him winning more. And I think that's how other people view McCarthy. I was like, oh, he was dealing with McCarthy. I don't think he was an obstacle to Aaron Rodgers winning more. Were, was there, like, if he had Bill Belichick, would he have won more? Yeah, probably. Like, sure. But, or had, if he had Andy Reid, would he have won more? Yeah. But I don't think he was an active hindrance to Aaron Rodgers winning Super Bowls. Hmm. That's my only point. Not that, oh, because he had McCarthy, he should win more. What I what I will do, though, is I'll go look at the guys with the multiple Super Bowls. I am. Bowls. That's, that's what I'm going to No, I'm going to go look and look. I'm going to go think about their coaches, too. I'm going to go definitely start their coaches. definitely what's getting ready to go happen. Because I, whether it's Elway or Matt, I look at some of the Super Bowl wins, mm-hmm. and it wasn't because of quarterback play. No, for sure. I mean, Manning. So I have to. I gotta, uh, I gotta take a look at that. Peyton's is the best example, and I think that is a a, a blotch on Peyton's record is that he didn't win when he was when he should have. At his peak. That's DB. I'm Robbie Lula. We'll be back tomorrow to wrap up the week here on Herd at Fourth Radio.